Hey, one of today's sponsors is BetterHelp, who's giving our audience 10% off their first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. BetterHelp gives you access to your own fully licensed and accredited therapist via phone, via chat, via video, whatever. It's a lot of therapists every, elsewhere, so you know, have long wait lists. And they can take uh, weeks, sometimes even months before you can they can see you. Uh, but when you sign up with BetterHelp, they match you with a therapist based on your specific needs, and you'll be communicating with them in less than 24 hours. Look, very stressful time we're living in. I can tell you just today, almost lost my mind uh, dealing with the, the Rubik's Cube that is uh, sending your kids to school today. Uh, but it's, it's stress coming from the pandemic or just, I don't know, relationship issues or uh, general anxiety, it is very helpful to talk to someone. And the really, the primary way you can do it today is remotely. So once BetterHelp connects you with a therapist, if you find out, you know, or you feel it's not a good fit, you can switch to a new one. You can do it at any time. You can do it at any reason, uh, for any reason, uh, for no additional charge. So the first two, I mean, sometimes it takes people a long time to feel comfortable with somebody. They have thousands of licensed therapists. They're all over the country. Some of them are uh, therapists with specialties that may be tricky to find, much easier through BetterHelp. BetterHelp also tends to be more affordable than therapists that you'd find through more traditional means. You don't need to have insurance to use BetterHelp, and they have financial aid options for those who qualify. BetterHelp is giving everyone in our audience 10% off your first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash majority report. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown brooklyn usa on the program today joe biden retains the lead in swing state polls We're looking at some maybe small voting reforms in michigan they may be able to process ballots before election day that could make a big difference meanwhile trump craters on his covid response fire still raging out west as the 104-year-old record of storms making landfall during hurricane season is broken as the Gulf Coast is slammed. Sadly, in the Delaware primary, Chris Coons wins. That is going to be an albatross around our necks for at least six years, ladies and gentlemen. The upside, we're on the verge of electing the highest elected elected official the first trans state senator in the country has been now nominated and will is expected to win in the general election in delaware democratic oversight committee slams boeing in the faa over their deadly failures brianna taylor's family wins a settlement but Ultimately, no justice. It's corruption and insanity at the Health and Human Services Department during a pandemic. One million people lost their health insurance, and that was in 2019. 
obviously worse now. And a mom's attempt to get uh, health care for her kids could send her to prison for 27 years. Nancy Pelosi's COVID relief strategy not only failed to help Americans, but now looks like it's going to fail moderate Democrats' re-election re- chances. Americans think crime in the U.S. is rising, and they are wrong. More on those ICE allegations of abuse and the loss of the temporary protected status for tens of thousands. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Is that, Matt, is that sound, is it dipping? Like, we have this weird relationship, don't we, between Mm -hmm. the music and me. Uh, And someone else said that my microphone has been low. Look, folks, here's the deal. And I say this only because we had a lot of time today, relatively speaking. (laughs) Otherwise, I wouldn't I wouldn't spend the time talking about this. Uh, You know, we're working with this off the shelf Zoom. We uh, and by we, of course, I mean, Kyle uh, have been able to um, customize it a bit. But ultimately, there's a lot of problems with the with the way that we, we, you know, have available to us. This is a problem for a lot of things, but we try and do something that's a little more ambitious. We try and do it every day. We don't pre-record the show. There's a lot of shows out there that you see that presumably are running live, but they're not really live. And um, so that, that creates other challenges. We, and by we, of course, I mean Kyle, are working on a custom system that is going to deal with a lot of these issues. It's going to be sweet. But uh, so bear with us, you know, apologies. You know, I get occasionally I'll get like, I'm a sound engineer and your sound is really, uh, (laughs) you're you're constantly, uh, you know, uh, you're dealing with the, you have deficiencies in your mix or, uh, I, I was contacted by somebody like, what are the specs you're using? What, uh, what uh, are you using a, uh, what kind of transcoder are you using? What kind of, um, cause I noticed your blacks are not crushed and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, uh, dude, I, you know, I, I take it as a compliment only insofar as that, like you, sir, or lady or whoever I'm this hypothetical person I'm addressing, you have no idea. Um, what we're able to do with, with so little here. I mean, I, you know. I feel like our reliability in the face of our tech struggles, ironically, or somehow speaks to our credibility to people. I would, I would agree. I'm not even sure I know what that formulation is, but, uh, but well, I, people, uh, people know and love our uh, tech problems, I think. Oh my gosh. That wouldn't be uh, MR if it wasn't. That's right. I mean, for the first like three years of the show, that was basically the our forte was our tech problems. That was the strongest part of the program, I thought. Ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, I I, I don't know if Donald Trump is uh, insane or uh, or evil, you know, stupid or evil, that that question, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there's certainly, um, I don't know if it's an either or choice either, but it is amazing to see what's going on at the health and human services right now, because it's both there as well. Uh, We will get to that in a moment. Donald Trump did a town hall with George Stephanopoulos last night. Now, understand that um, Donald Trump's electoral strategy seems to be Aside from, you know, the mechanical parts of of suppressing votes, like literally vote suppression and uh, disenfranchisement, et cetera, et cetera, and questioning the legitimacy of the of the election, which is all part of that. That's the mechanical side, the sort of pure rhetorical political side. What they seem to have settled on is Joe Biden mentally incapable of being the president because of his gaffes or the fact that he's, I don't know. I mean, I I don't think it's a hard, I don't think it's a hard argument to make in a vacuum. The problem is that it's really not a vacuum. 
It's a choice. It's a choice between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So you can't just look at Joe Biden in a vacuum and assess like, well, is he really mentally sharp enough to do this? Because you need to compare it to what? And that what is Donald Trump. And so that puts a lot of pressure on him. So moments like this <laughs> on yeah. the George Stephanopoulos show uh, or a town hall are highly problematic for Donald Trump. You know, otherwise it wouldn't be, but they have made this issue of every time you can't find a word that you're searching for is an indication you're unfit for the office of the presidency. So there's two problems that Trump has with this response. One is that superficial one that I've just said, but it's not superficial because in the context of his campaign, it's problematic. And the other is he's calling for the death of about 1.5 million people. Play this clip. Go away without the vaccine? Sure, over a period of time. Sure, with time, it goes and many away. deaths. And you'll develop, you'll develop herd, like a herd mentality. It's going to be, it's going to be herd developed, and that's going to happen. That will all happen. But with the vaccine, I think it will go away very quickly. So he's talking about a vaccine, and Stephanopoulos, you're going to get the, the vac vaccine. He said it's going to go away anyways. All you need is that herd mentality. You know, herd development. You need to develop a herd. Then the herd itself, of course, has a mentality, and the mentality tells it to go away. His ability to ignore matters of mass death. Like, Stephanopoulos is like, yeah, but many people will die. And he's like, yeah, but we'll have the herd mentality. The, the, the fact is, is that if herd immunity is achieved at like 70%, you'll have 2 million people die. It could be achieved at a lower amount. It could be 60%, could be 55%. And then you're talking about anywhere from like a million to a million five people dying. Right now in this country, I, I would imagine we're probably close to maybe 20%, maybe, maybe probably closer to like 15%. I'm sorry, 20%, I would say in the Northeast, maybe. Uh, the rest of the country, 10 to 15%, maybe. 5 million cases that we know of. We know that some people have some like immunity, but we can't measure T cells. Uh, I guess five is really 1%, but I suspect it's a little bit higher. So let's just call it like five or 10% across the country. So to get up to, even if you think it's at 40%, you're still talking about, you know, 600,000 people dying. If you think it's at 50%, 800,000 people dying and so on and so on. And of course, uh, we have a president who apparently based on his own standards. I mean, that, that puts a lot of pressure on you, doesn't it, Matt? Like, what if I had to go and assess other people, other commentators based upon their pronunciation of names or their how many ums they recite during the day. That would put a lot of pressure on me. Yeah, it's like if we made it a regular segment to find any mispronunciation of a guest on cable news. That's and right. Had... And then look at this guy. Look at this commentator. Look at how many times he says um. <laughs> you can't take anything he takes seriously. He says um so many times. That would put a lot of pressure on me. Yeah, I, I, this is... I'd be mad at the staffer who decided on this as the main strategy. <laughs> um, couldn't you have come up with something Guys. different? Guys, mental acuity. Can't we talk about how he's bad at golf? Yeah, yeah. how about that? What about he's not rich? He likes to take the train. Can we say that? Train Joe? Trainy Joe? No, I guess that doesn't work. Well, did we just cross 200,000 deaths? Yes, we did. Oh, uh, we did. I think... Um, yesterday yeah. maybe it was last night um yep congratulations everybody the, and and the, there's no contemplation about it i mean look yeah. to a certain extent this is um a natural phenomenon right i mean you know donald trump is not responsible 
for the pandemic. Now, there is an argument that had we left in place the entire apparatus that had been built to warn the country and to really warn the world about pandemics, right? We had people embedded in China to suss out these things that were fired. We had a member of the National Security Council who had a whole team that was sitting on the National Security Council as a way of providing some type of early warning system, obviously for the country, but for the world too. Now, it is true that Donald Trump got rid of that. It is a very tough counterfactual to assess. Would that have stopped it? But what we can do is we can look at like a country like Canada. And I think based upon their population and their deaths, and I guess granted on some level, they're a little bit more sparsely spread out. Maybe, I don't know if their concentration really is uh, dispersed differently. But we would have something like 7,000 deaths in this country if we were consistent with what Canada's numbers are. And, um, and we have 200,000 deaths. And when you contemplate the, how the country changed when we lost about 3,000 people on 9-11, when you contemplate the hundreds of thousands who died because of 9-11, because of what we did, the way that we chose to react, the millions who were displaced, the incredible instability that it created, still feeling it 20 years out. And in six months, we have lost 200,000 people because the president didn't want to freak out the stock market. Somehow decided that it was most electorally advantageous to him to deny its existence I think in other circumstances, it also was there's uh, an opportunity to monetize this. In a way, it might be less efficient than having government respond, but it is going to provide some friends with some money. Uh, it really is. It's it is stunning. And it's also just the. I mean, I guess at one point the country just sort of like has to become a little bit callous and a nerd to it and just sort of I don't know. I, I, how do you there's a certain amount of denial that seems to be going on. I mean, I, you know, and I understand it. Um, certainly when we were waging war in Iraq, you walk around, you'd have no idea that we were, we were at war and, and, and how many people we were killing. You'd have no idea. So I guess in that respect, I mean, at least there's some consistency. Um, at least we do it to ourselves too. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that shows a certain amount of integrity, right? Um, folks, a couple of ads. There has never been, I don't know if there's never been a better time, but this is a great time to learn something new. Uh, many of us are still in sort of a holding pattern. And this is a good time to learn some new things. Uh, and with thousands of options available, finding the best way to learn can be challenging. One of my strongest recommendations, an app called Blinkist. Blinkist is unique. It is powerful. It works on your phone or your tablet or your computer or wherever, wherever, you, uh, wherever you get your digital information. It takes the key ins uh, Blinkist takes the key insights from over 3,000 nonfiction bestsellers. They have 27 categories. They condense them down into what they call Blinks. You can read these or you can listen to them in 15 minutes. Read or listen. And now Blinkist also offers its members exclusive original podcasts from top authors, authors, and creative thinkers. You can also dive deeper into full-length nonfiction audiobooks at a special discounted price. Matt Leck, your favorite aspect of that. Over 14 million people use Blinkist to deepen their knowledge in topics spanning from self-improvement, management, happiness, much more. 
For me, uh, I've told you a million times why I use Blinkist. There are books I just don't, I, I frankly, with all due respect to the authors, not interested in reading the whole book. But they, but they pique my interest just enough that I'm willing to invest 15 minutes as opposed to, I don't know, a couple of hours, 10 hours, five hours, four hours, 15 minutes I can do. And I, you know, I, I weigh it against how much I really want to read the book or, you know, also uh, how, how much I want to admit to myself that I need to improve in a certain area because I'm in denial half the time. So I'll listen to Blinkist. I'll listen to sometimes before I go to bed, sometimes uh, when I'm exercising or I don't know when I'm doing the, the yard work or walking the dog. I don't have a dog, but there's all sorts of times you can use Blinkist. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer for just our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. You start your seven-day free trial. You get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership and up to 65% off audiobooks. You get to keep those forever. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. You get 25% off a premium membership and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. Go check out, go like, for instance, like Rachel Maddow's blowout. With all due respect, didn't want to sit down and read the whole thing. Interesting to get the perspective on it, though. Now you got him 15 minutes. Uh, you've seen that Rick Wilson thing where he gets on that uh, tunes uh, thing, which is pretty funny. Well, now you can read his book, Everything Trump Touches Dies. Starting to see a pattern there. I don't want to read uh, these books, but to get 15 minutes. Blinkist.com slash majority report. You're going to get a great deal. 25% off premium membership and a seven day free trial. Check that out. Also, um, a lot of people buying online these days for obvious reasons. It used to be when my daughter used to buy stuff online. I already knew this, but when my daughter did, I used to have to walk her through. This is how you find a coupon code, sweetie. Why? Because I'm thrifty. It's not cheap to do that. It take you know, it would take five or ten minutes. You save save five or ten bucks. Well, then my life changed. Honey, it's the free browser extension. It scours the internet for the promo codes. You don't have to look for them. It automatically applies the best ones that are available at checkout. You no longer have to go to all those coupon code sites, click on it, find out it doesn't work. Here's how it does work. You get honey on your computer for free. Two easy clicks by going to joinhoney.com slash majority. Joinhoney.com slash majority. Then when you're checking out one of its over 30,000 supported sites, boom, Honey pops up. All you have to do is click apply coupons. Wait a few seconds. Honey searches for the coupons. If there are any that are decent or good, then it applies it to your cart. Bingo, bango, over. Don't have to search it. That whole ritual of thrifty dads telling their daughters or their sons how to search for a coupon code over honey has found over 17 million members over two billion dollars in savings check it out i have no idea how much money i've saved with uh, honey basically because my daughter uh you know buys the bulk of the stuff that it gets purchased here but um i i i i'm convinced it's hundreds at this point and it's it just makes it much easier you don't have to have that talk with the kids. It's simple. If you have a computer, Honey should be on it. It's free. It works with whatever browser you have. You can go, you can get Honey today for free at joinhoney.com slash majority. That's joinhoney.com slash majority. And lastly, Third Love uses the measurements of millions of women to design bras with all day comfort and support. Every Third Love bra is made with a signature memory foam cups, no slip straps and scratch free band. Their Fit Finder quiz will help you find the size and styles that are right for you. Over 15 million women have taken the quiz to date. Third Love helps you identify your breast size and shape. And it finds the styles that fit your body. Their perfect fit promise means you don't have, if you don't love it, exchanges are, uh, and returns are free for 60 days. Also, Third Love donates all of their gently used return bras to women in need, supporting charities in their local San Francisco Bay Area and across the United States. Folks, I'm not going to lie to you. I do not wear a bra. However, we did have the official Majority Report uh, bra trier 
and wearer um, come back with a review. And uh, this is what she said. The idea that I had 60 days to try out the bras drew me in. But the, in the end, I don't think I've ever had a better experience buying clothing online. Certainly not when it comes to bras. The Fit Finder worked like a charm. The choice of styles, amazing. Both bras I ordered were a perfect fit. That almost never happens. They are incredibly comfortable. They are cute and they are subtle. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering my listeners 10% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash majority now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 10% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash majority for 10% off. Okay, let's go to um, the, I mentioned this yesterday and it is sort of blown up now. Apparently, the, the health and human services official, Michael Caputo, who was a Trump campaign guy, and he was put on, uh, he, was, he was made the communications head of, of HHS. And his job has been basically to assault the CDC to get them to fudge their numbers in such a way that it doesn't look like we are in the midst of a pandemic that is being completely mishandled by the administration. The HHS has gotten so corrupted. I mean, look, this is going to be a story in every single agency, but this guy seems to be sort of unique in terms of his, I don't know, mental stability. And that is, that's not my assessment. That's his. Um, we also have a situation, there's, a, there's another story out today that the HHS has also been assaulting the FDA. We'll talk about that in a bit. But here is Michael Caputo on his own personal Facebook page doing a Facebook Live video. This was, I think, on Sunday. And he since deleted it, but apparently people found it. Check out this bat crap crazy stuff this guy is saying and remember he is the guy who's been leaning on the cdc and and trying to get them to shape their mortality reports whether it's the buffalo news or the new york times or the wall street journal or or uh any of these media outlets um i'm under siege uh it's been going on for a couple of weeks and uh I don't care um, because I have the president's support. I know that because he's told me so. Uh, they're after me for two reasons. And when a hybrid, I want to, uh, I want to tell you what they are so you understand. And you understand that uh, I'm not going anywhere. They're going to have to kill me. And unfortunately, I think that's where this is going. The partisan Democrats the conjugal media and the scientists, the deep state scientists, want America sick through November. They cannot afford for us to have any good news before November because they're already losing. Donald Trump right now, if the election were held today, would win. Not by much, not by much. And I want to talk about that for a minute, but he would win. And that's why Kamala Harris is out there talking like an anti-vaxxer. I know some people on my feed are against vaccines, and I encourage you not to get one to, if you don't want one. Uh, I encourage you to follow freedom and to, to anywhere it leads. But I'm going to get a vaccine. In fact, as Assistant Secretary of Health, I'll be one of the first ones to get a vaccine. And I know it's safe because I'm involved in its development, not as, a, you know, just watching it closely. And let me tell you something. There is tons of positive news out there about this pandemic. And the Democrats can't have it. Their conjugal media can't have it. And there are scientists working for this government who do not want America to get better. Did you hear me? There are scientists who work for this government who do not want America to get well. Not until after Joe Biden is, been, is president. It's a fact. I know it because I've heard it. They can, these people cannot cannot allow America to get better, nor can they allow America to hear good news. So uh, this is a part of his Facebook Live. Um, uh, I, 
breakdown in many respects that he broadcast on Sunday. He has since uh, taken it down. He referred to uh, during that same uh, video uh, that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention harbored what he called resistance units that were determined to undermine President Trump. Uh, in addition, you saw that he suggested that he, um, he could be personally uh, in danger of being killed. And he went on to say at one point, if you carry guns, buy ammunition, ladies and gentlemen, because it's going to be hard to get. This is what he said to his uh, followers. Uh, more in this New York Times account, he went further, saying his physical health was in question and his, quote, mental health has definitely failed. Um, I know, I guess he gets points for self-awareness, but I don't know how deep the self-awareness is. Right. Yeah. I don't, I think it's pretty superficial. I mean, I, you can always get tripped up by that. There are people who are very self-aware, but they don't make the, the, they don't take the last step. I don't like being alone in Washington. Caputo said, quote, shadows on the ceiling in my apartment. They're alone. Shadows are so long. Uh huh. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh because it's horrible, but I it have really to is. because otherwise I would start to cry. Mm-hmm. Um, he's keeping a close eye on the vaccine. Yeah, nice. He's complaining in that video of the fact that uh, nobody's talking about the good stories about the pandemic. Yet he also said, "You're not waking up every morning and talking about dead Americans." Um. He urged people to attend Trump rallies, but only with masks. He's being somewhat. uh, And he goes, uh, CDC science, quote, haven't gotten out of their sweatpants except for meetings at coffee shops to plot how they're going to attack Donald Trump next. He said there are scientists who work for this government who do not want America to get well, not until after Joe Biden is president. I think you saw that. Um, Now, you should know that Mr. Caputo, who is the communications um, person for health and human services doesn't know anything about medical care. He has no medical background at all. Um, He went on in that same video to say when Donald Trump refuses to stand down at inauguration uh, because Biden is not is going to refuse to concede, the shooting will begin, he said. The drills that you've seen are nothing, he said. Uh, he said that there are hit squads being trained all over the country. And he said, you understand, uh, that they're going to have to kill me. And unfortunately, I think that's what this is going. Of course, uh, Caputo would be high on the hit list, of course. Of, uh, and, um, he said that scientists deep in the bowels of the CDC, walked, quote, around like they are monks and holy men, but engaged in rotten science. That is the guy who has been leaning on CDC scientists to mess with their mortality reports. Evil, stupid, insane, it doesn't matter. I don't know that there's like, I think it's like, I am almost at the point now where to even create those categories is in and of itself a category error. These things go hand in hand. When your agenda, which they have said since day one almost, is to destroy the administrative state, there is no difference between a, you know, a a vaguely insane person and um, somebody who is, they're attempting to corrupt the agencies just to function on behalf of an ag- a political agenda. I mean, there's just, and not a political agenda in the sense that like, hey, it's a political agenda that citizens should not be responsible for getting cancer as the price, uh, as the cost of allowing corporations to have more profit. You could argue that's a political agenda, and, and, and I would say maybe it is on some level, but I'm just talking like pure partisan agenda. 
which is, I don't even care what one way or another, what's going on here. She's like, what makes it best for Donald Trump to get elected? Period. End of story. Meanwhile, Health and Human Services, same department, Secretary Alex Azar, according to the Times today, led an escalating pressure campaign against his own Food and Drug Administration this spring and summer, urging the agency to abandon its responsibility for ensuring the safety and accuracy of a range of coronavirus tests as the pandemic raged. Overriding objections from FDA Chief Stephen Hahn, Azar revoked the agency's ability to check the quality of tests developed by individual labs for their own use. This is according to seven current and former administration officials with knowledge of the decision. Hey, folks, I know you're not all science people or doctor people, but can anybody think of what might be problematic about pulling back on the requirements that tests for, I don't know, say a no novel corona coronavirus what the implications of pulling back on assessing the accuracy of these tests as these tests get rolled out? Can anybody, anybody out there guess what might be problematic about that? You think you have it, but you don't. You think you don't have it, but you do. Hmm. The unilateral policy change, which applies to lab-developed tests for a wide range of diseases, included COVID-19, had long been sought by commercial university and public health labs in the name of greater flexibility, but Han viewed the move as inappropriate and ill-timed because it removed safeguards designed to prevent inaccurate tests from flooding the market during a public health crisis. Look, in less urgent epochs, the idea that, okay, we're going to have some flexibility. We've, we've established that this is safe, but we don't know if it's accurate, this test. We're going to roll them out because, you know, it's not like it's a, not a pandemic. The accuracy of the test, we can double check the accuracy of the test. We can base it upon something else. I mean, I can understand the theory behind that. I don't know the science enough to know that maybe in other instances, uh, it might be a good idea to, to, to create some flexibility there. But in the course of a pandemic, where everyone is rushing to put their tests on the market, A, because there's a ton of cash to be made and there's a huge demand for it and desperate need for it. The idea that you're putting out tests that are inaccurate when you have a 10-day, 14-day, 5-day horizon in which you can give this disease to somebody else seems to be the height of stupidity and irresponsibility. Azar's decision is the latest example of the Trump administration appointees overruling experts at public health agencies. It comes at a per particularly perilous time for the FDA, which is struggling to balance President Donald Trump's push for a vaccine by election day with public fears that the agency will rubber stamp an ineffective or dangerous shot. Why would the public feel that way? I've never seen such a complete political overruling of the agency, said one former HHS official. It makes me worried about what's to come. <laughs> uh, HHS chief of staff, Brian Harrison, cast the decision as driven by legal considerations. Primarily, it was our lawyers advising us that this review requirement was illegal. Mm-hmm. He said in the statement, additionally, everyone would agree at the beginning of a pandemic, we need to maximize the development of quality diagnostics as fast as possible. Well, you know, you got to balance fast and quality. After the FDA loosened the rules for these tests early in the pandemic, allowing labs to delay seeking emergency use authorization, it discovered widespread flaws. 82 of 125 tests eventually submitted to the FDA for authorization had design or validation problems. 
That was reported last week in the New England Journal of Medicine. The agency experienced similar problems when it decided this spring to let antibody tests hit the market without agency review. The FDA reversed course in mid-April, recalling scores. Scores is 12, isn't that? Is that right, Matt? Four score? I thought it was 20, but maybe I'm wrong. 20, I think it's 20, 20, 20. Recalling 20s of faulty or inaccurate tests. (laughs) Four score. Yes, 20. Uh, So that's where we are with the Department of Health and uh, Human Services. And credit where credit's due. I don't think he did it in the most eloquent or dramatic fashion but it certainly was appropriate and it's helpful. I know there's a sense of like, who cares about this? But there are people who are going to be aware that there is a problem at Health and Human Services when Chuck Schumer gets to the floor and calls for the resignation of Alex Azar, the head of that department. Over the weekend, there were numerous reports that political appointees at HHS have been interfering with CDC's report on COVID-19, trying to delay, edit out, or halt the release of facts that would have been politically embarrassing to the president. This is not the first time the administration has tried to hide reports and facts that would better inform the American people. Meanwhile, as that is happening, President Trump has pressured HHS to slow the testing down. He's overstated the benefits of certain treatments and pressured the FDA to approve them and accused FDA officials of holding back a vaccine. And too many people within HHS are trying to suppress the science. The Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, has not only failed to push back against these outrageous moves by President Trump, he's been almost entirely silent about the chaos and mismanagement in his own agency. In Trump's Trump's administration, the most important skill is the ability to stand up to the president and resist political influence. More, More in an agency like HHS than others where the health of Americans is at stake. So there it is. I mean, look, the value of that, I know people are going to be a little bit cynical about it. And the value, I'm not going to overstate the value. But there are people going to see that and say, hey, there's a problem here. (laughs) Um, And there is. I mean, there's a dramatic problem here. And it's indicative of what we're seeing in our government across all these agencies. We're just more focused on this right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic. But in the absence of the pandemic, we'd be hearing about what's going on at the EPA. In the absence of a pandemic, we would be hearing more about what's going on at OSHA. Or, I mean, just name it. (laughs) All of these agencies have been degraded dramatically. This is what our government does. It it is supposed to function as a bulwark between private enterprise trying to create profits by dishing off the externalities onto us in the form of cost, in the form of our health, in the form of our happiness, in the form of our some respects you want to call it our liberty or our privacy that is that is what these agencies are supposed to do it, it's not clean they have an army of lawyers who will go in and they will try and defang these regulations and they'll roll them back and they have lobbyists who will pay to influence lawmakers to make the laws that um that will inhibit the ability of these agencies to go forward. No doubt, it is not a perfect system. It's not even remotely close. 
but he is this administration. And this happens with Republicans generally. It's just that um, they're just completely brazen about it. And our system had no capacity to deal with it. I mean, the guy at Department of Homeland Security has now been deemed to be illegally serving. He is impersonating the chairman of the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, that's basically what's going on there. By a federal judge and by a government agency, the government account uh, oversight, uh, uh, government accountability agency. And what are they doing at this point? Let's play this clip. This is Don Wooten. I mentioned this yesterday. There is, we, we don't have a huge amount of public substantiation for what she's talking about, at least in, in some respects. The coronavirus stuff, I think, is quite obvious uh, because there are some records that will back this up. The doctor that she's talking about has been named. There are seven immigrants with, uh, with representation who have backed up her claims here. Um, I think we got to be careful about, you know, until there's more investigation, but we do have a whistleblower and we do have attorneys who feel like their, their clients have substantiated this. Here's Don Wooden. She was on uh, Chris Hayes's program last night. She is the whistleblower from uh, who worked at a private detention center for immigrants, essentially a private prison. They were providing no protection for these people for in terms of COVID. And reportedly, many of these immigrant women were taken to a doctor where they had hysterectomies and were not told that's what was happening and there was no reason for them. You talk about in the complaint uh, a hearing from women who were detained there, talking about a specific doctor uh, performing hysterectomies, um, referring to him as a uterus collector. Tell us about how you heard about this doctor and what women said about their experiences with him. You have um, detained women. I had several detained women on numerous occasions that would come to me and say, Miss Wooten, I had hysterectomy. Um, why? I had no answers as to why they had those procedures. Um, and one lady walked up to me here this last time around between October of 19 until July the 2nd. And she said, what is he? Is he the uterus collector? Does he collect uteruses? And I asked her, what does she mean? And she says, everybody that I talked to has had a hysterectomy. And you just don't know what to say. I mean, I don't, I don't have a answer for why that they would come to me and they would say, is he the uterus collector? I mean, that's where we're at at this point. And again, there are, are attorneys who represent seven of these immigrant women who um, substantiate their side of that story. And I've seen stories that have named the doctor. I don't know if they're quite, let me see. I think it's, um, I think it's an NBC story, in which case I feel a little more confident in mentioning it. Um, not 100% sure if it has. Uh, but NBC, the whistleblower Don Wooden says that uh, Irwin, which is run by the private corporation LaSalle Corrections, has underreported COVID-19 cases, knowingly placed staff and detainees at risk of contracting the virus, neglected medical complaints, and refused to test symptomatic uh, detainees, among other dangerous practices. Um, the Legal Advocacy Group Project South has submitted a complaint to the Office of Inspector General on Wooten's behalf, which also included testimony uh, collected from inter interviews with detainees. This is not the only for-profit detention company to face scrutiny for dangerous mishandling of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, goes on to talk more about that. 
people are, you know, are a little bit tentative about reporting on the the hysterectomies because it is an an appalling and frankly you're talking about this is a crime against humanity and so genocide. people are, it is genocide it is being and so people are being circumspect about it and they should uh i don't know i mean I'm not going to speculate as to like, I I've seen at different points, what appears to be the name of the doctor, but I don't know these websites. And so I'm just not going to, I'm not going to go there. It's, it's sort of, it will get reported out at this point if it is real. And I suppose you can make the argument that like, this is not something, is it really that far fetched? I mean, we have, we still have children who have been separated from their parents by the U.S. government, kidnapped by the U.S. government, not returned to their parents. Months, in some cases years later. I think people would be surprised to know that uh, it was, I guess, early in the 20th century, not even that early. The U.S. government, the Supreme Court found that it was okay for the U.S., and institutions to uh, to to provide unconsented to hysterectomies, but this is a hundred years later, and you've got immigrant women who are like, "What? Why? Why did I have a hysterectomy?" So we'll see, but uh, it's disturbing. I wonder if that if it if it bears out that that's the case. Is that like? Is that sufficient? Is that a sufficient difference? I just find it depressing in the context of the debate we had about whether ice camps, we can call them concentration camps, when that's just what they are descriptively. And that makes me pessimistic for ability to face reality on this stuff widely anyway. We'll see. I mean, I find it hard to believe this is a wide policy. My guess is if this bears out to be the case, that what we're looking at is someone uh, is a doctor who was trying to, you know, commit some type of fraud in some weird way, a cash in on it, a billing fraud. But of course, you know, if Don Wooten knows it and reports it up the chain of command and nobody does anything about it, is there really a material difference about it? Right. It does. It does it really have to be a plan that is being executed for it to be heinous and criminal? Or is it enough that it's just like, we don't care what happens to these people. Somebody's making a buck by, by performing hysterectomies, unnecessary hysterectomies on these immigrants, whatever. Do you, I, 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 I will tell you right now that if it is the case that there is a doctor who this private prison essentially was using and the doctor was running some type of, I don't know, billing scam and undoubtedly somebody back at the private um, prison is getting a kickback that the right will say like, this is not, this was just a guy who was committing fraud. But when you set up a system like this, where job number one, is profit <laughs> profiting off of these people as if they are pieces of meat then of course this type of thing follows it's unbelievable all right we gotta take a quick break head into the uh, fun half we have some some decent news i think I'm trying to, I'm trying to see Brianna Taylor's family uh, got uh, $12 million and there were some police reforms, but they did not concede that they made a mistake. Louisville. Um, I guess COVID's relief strategy is beginning to uh, fall apart. That's not uh, positive. 
Um, I guess the upside is just that, you know, uh, only 35 percent of the country approve of Donald Trump's COVID response. And so that suggests that there's 65 percent of. Of Americans who are. Sent in it. And can be aware of what's going on around them. That is, I guess that's positive, right? Just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible, folks. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Check out the AM Quick. Oh, you know, I want to read a couple of, uh, of, of, uh, of emails. This is apropos right now, too. Let's see, I'll put this one here. I'll be second. I'll be third. Where did the other email go? Uh, I like this one. This is a good email. Hi, Sam. I wanted to send you an email to you for a long time to thank you what you for what you do. I decided to sit down and write it today because your show was uh, today was so good. The interview with Thomas Frank was extremely fascinating. You had me laughing out loud with the Steve Ducey gaffes. I'm relatively new to a lot of progressive ideas, and you gave me the perfect mix of political comedy combined with intellectual commentary and history and interviews and all-around good takes. You deserve a far bigger audience. You have. I wish everyone would listen to you at Ben Shapiro. Blah, blah, blah. Um, Seriously, Sam, you and the MR crew have gotten me through the past three months, and I want to personally thank you for that. He goes on to say, I also want to give you my condolences for the loss of Michael. I heard his passing through the Chapo gang and found a video of you and Michael on YouTube. I was hooked. I wish I started listening to your show years ago because I would have gotten to listen to Michael more. He goes on and then he says, I am 19 years old. So this will be my first presidential election I get to vote in, even though everything sucks. You've made it uh, me excited to learn about politics and somehow voting for Biden. I wish I was voting for Bernie. I get so excited when the show's intro music comes on. I'm proud to say I have it, uh, the intro memorized, broadcasting live, steps and steps and steps. Uh, and he goes on to say, you are the coolest person in media. Thank you. And wow. Yeah, that is, uh, that, that's when I started to think, hey, is this a real email? <laughs> but no, a I, like, a, uh, and he says, left is best. 19 year old, folks. 19, oh, and here we go. <laughs> Uh, AMQ rocks, and also thank you, Matt, for the tip on the smalls. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Now you know it's real. Yeah, it's got good uh, taste. And uh, then I got two other emails that I thought were appropriate for now. In fact, I think I got a couple more of these. Uh, one is from Richard. Sam, just pretend her actual full name is Nomi Key, and you'll never get it wrong again. So they, this guy said N O M I, capital K E Y, Nomi Key which I think is also uh, helpful. Uh, but then this guy writes me, Jim writes, your variety of pronunciations in, of Nomi Key are amusing. And from what I heard on today's Fun Half, you've been given a few tips to help you. The one that helps me accent the correct syllables is Nomi Key. <laughs> Nomi Key. That's N-O, small n, and then M, small c, K-E-E. -E. So now I've got like so many uh, different uh, things yeah, exactly. keeping straight in my head. No, uh, no, McKee. Does that sound right to you? No, it's, I think the employee, no, McKee, no, McKee, no, McKee, no, McKee. No, McKee. Yeah, let's, let's keep it simple, guys. <laughs> it's uh, Jimmy Pick. Jamie, oh. J Jamie, Jamie Pick, Peck. Oh, boy. Um, uh, folks, don't forget, you can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And don't forget the AMQ, AM Quickie. You can sign up for it at amquickie.com. And don't forget the No McKee Show. You can uh, find it at youtube.com slash the No McKee Show. Or at patreon.com slash the No McKee Show. It is on at 3 p.m. every day. Jamie, what is, uh, what is up with you? You there? She go away? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. I was uh, just... What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> I was... Okay, so I don't have a real light to light my face when I'm on camera. So what I do is I bring the lamps from other parts of my house and I put them on the table by my computer. And I forgot to do that today because I'm a little bit sick and not on the ball. 
<laughs> well, uh, you have a, there's a really uh, a wonderful noir quality uh, to your camera today. <laughs> so, uh, what is that? What is happening on the Antifada? Well, that's a very good question. Um, we actually didn't record it this week, but we're going to today mm -hmm. because I was actually sick uh, the past couple of days and didn't really fill up to it. But um, I'm recording one with Sean today. We're going to talk about the news. I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, and in the meantime, folks can watch or watch, listen to our episode from last week with Brace Belden, very funny guy, um, did an episode on Wednesday with him, talk about labor history and the Vanguard party. That's free for everyone. And on Friday, a little bonus about punk rock. So check it out. Patreon.com mm -hmm. slash the Antifada. Matt? Uh, yeah. Yeah. TMBS last night, uh, we had Joshua Khan Russell on to talk about the sort of organizing against the wildfires in the face of, you know, toxic air. And then Ben Burgess on to talk about John Ronson's book on public shaming and uh, about sailors stuck at sea for coronavirus for many, many weeks. Uh, so patreon.com slash TMBS. Uh, check that out, folks. Quick break. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're not paying. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, you know, I was struggling for some positive news before. And uh, like I said, uh, Michigan, uh, I think a, a court there or the Michigan Assembly, I think, is voting on a bill to allow for the processing of ballots before Election Day. And I can't count them, but they can get them into a sort of uh, they can they can put them in the, you know, get them in loaded up so that they can be counted on election day. Um, 
uh, you know, taken out of the envelope, kept in the sealed envelope, that type of thing. That's good uh, because if Michigan can come in with a result on the night of the election and it is in favor of uh, Biden, that would be helpful. Um, Ohio, apparently a judge thwarted the Republican plan to allow only one ballot box in each county. Sort of arbitrary. One county, one box. That's all you need. Simple. Uh, uh, yeah. Simple. simple plans are always the best. No, oh, yeah. Those are, you know, keep it, one pla- let's keep one- it simple, stupid. <laughs> Here is Donald Trump and George Stephanopoulos. And here's Donald Trump. I, you know, I had a, a little uh, conversation with a buddy of mine last night and he's like, I don't, I, you know, I don't think the Woodward tapes mean anything. And like, I, you know, and, and it, it's possible. It's not an unreasonable assessment, but it's, it is the, the reality is it has chewed up amount of time. Uh, it is just less time that Donald Trump has to try and suppress, again, politically, not mechanically, uh, Joe Biden's votes every moment that he has to do that. Now, we also have data that shows that his support on COVID, at the very least, has dropped in the wake of these things. So I suspect that it actually has meant something. But, but you know, in this era, who knows what means anything? But here's George Stephanopoulos and Donald Trump at the town hall last night minus the town um talking about coronavirus and the increasing amounts of death that we are experiencing so i feel that we've done a a tremendous job actually and it's something that i don't think it's been recognized like it should But when you look at our testing, when you look at our swabs, when you look at our ventilators, when you look at what we've done with hospitals, and we've made a lot of governors look very good, and now some are in a shutdown and some aren't, we'd like to see it open up and open up as soon as possible. But we're very proud of the job we've done, and uh, we've saved a lot of lives, a tremendous number of lives. Mr. President, you mentioned a number of things. So let's talk about the mortality first, because you mentioned, said we're doing better in mortality than other countries. But here's this chart right here. It shows the, the United States is right here. This is number of deaths per million residents. Here's Western Europe here, Canada, way down there. We, we're not at the top of the list. The excess mor- mortality rate is... Uh, among the best in the whole world, George. I mean, I can show you. There's a chart that just came out a little while ago. Why? Excess mortality rate is compared to uh, Europe, compared to other places, it's uh, about 25% better. In one case, it's over 60% better. And we also have a very big country. You know, this is, we're talking about a lot bigger than most countries. Uh, when you look at testing, just as an example, when India does 40 million less tests than us, they have 1.5 billion people. Uh, China, you don't get the accurate numbers out of China, but China, they lost a lot of people. They just don't say but what you know, we have 4% of the world's population, more than 20% of the cases, more than 20% of the deaths. Well, we have 20% of the cases because of the fact that we do much more testing. If we wouldn't do testing, you wouldn't have cases. You would have very few cases. Is, what you about know, the deaths? Well, most actually, these are actual cases. Well, Dr. Fauci said we've done a fantastic job. He just... Oh, now he's talking about Fauci. He doesn't address the fact that we also coincidentally have 20% more deaths. Now, how do we, how is that manufactured? And when he's talking about excess mortality, I would love to see those charts because excess mortality, the fact that we're beating people by 25 or 60% on that, I mean, it's hard to know what he's talking about, but it, that sounds like not a good thing. You know, like, Excess mortality, to the extent that I understand it, and it's hard to know what he's talking about here, would be a chart that compares March, let's say, 2019 to March, September, you know, September, uh, excuse me, September 2019 to March 2020 and September 2020. And you could assess how many more deaths did we have during that six month period versus the year over year numbers, essentially. And then you would go back to 2018, you go back to 2017, 2016, and there's a pattern, right? We have, a, you know, the number of deaths we have each year in the United States is fairly static at certain, you know, you could, you could chop it up in terms of localities. You can chop it up in terms of like, you know, uh, uh, time periods. But it's, it's, it's fairly 
relatively static. When you have a big year over year jump in mortality rates, you, it, it begs the question, why is that? When you're in the midst of a deadly pandemic, the answer is pretty obvious. It's probably the pandemic. And if we have better mortality, uh, excess mortality rates than other countries, that's a bad thing. Oh, well, don't forget all the deaths of despair from the people who were forced to uh, practice social distancing, distancing or wear a mask. You know, those count, too. Those are in the Democrat side. Those that's, would count in excess deaths, wouldn't they? They they would. I mean, what you wouldn't be able to do is you wouldn't be able to disaggregate, you know, like, OK, maybe maybe suicides have gone up in this instance. We don't know that, but it's conceivable. At the same time, car accidents probably would drop in that same six month period because people were not traveling at all for the, you know, March, April, May. They weren't driving as much. Yeah. Um, we, so deaths tough. from the normal flu, too, I imagine, would drop in this scenario. That's correct. I would assume. Our world and data has some excess mortality uh, numbers here. And if you look at the United States, you can see the UK has a massive spike here, but they got it down. That's, you know, a sign of a smaller population in the US. We are consistently like crushing other people. I mean, recently, I guess, I don't know what's going on with this recent data, but over the course of this entire pandemic, we've been basically the, the one most consistently above everybody else. So we're winning. Yeah, it's not good though. <laughs> it's just the <laughs> wrong one, race. baby. We're just winning the wrong race. I we're think. winning the population control race in this country. You know, to be fair, I don't think we can 100% trust the numbers coming out of China, but I distrust the numbers coming out of the Trump White House more. I, I think that we, I think it's, I think you, we should absolutely be skeptical of the number of people who died in China. However, we also know that they seem to be pretty confidently opening up. So whatever their timeline is I think we can be assured of how many died in that moment. It's hard to know. And now, of course, they could lock down in a in a far more efficient way than we could. Uh, but really, the issue is, look at Canada. Let's go to the phones. Calling from a three eight six area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, this is B from Queens. Um, I called like six or seven months ago um, okay. to uh, talk about my MAGA supporting family Ooh. and how to talk to them. Yes. Um, and just, you know, a bit of an update. Uh, so clearly a lot has happened in the past seven months. Um, and I talked to my mother fairly periodically like once you know um the black lives matter protest started getting very intense i bugged her even more and tried to educate her and we found some common ground there and stuff and it's 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 gotten to the point now where like she's she has a defense for like like she just brushes things off as like Trump's got a mouth on him. And I, you know, recently the last thing I texted her was slightly confrontational and she just hasn't responded yet because it overwhelms her. But um, I was like, you know, you are, you are siding with people who want me dead. Like the president in no uncertain terms said that there needs to be retribution for what quote unquote the left is doing when we can clearly see that the right is the one agitating and you, you know we've you know got lots of data saying that the majority of terror in this country is being done by far right groups well that's and, what the dhs says yeah, if you want to yeah, believe trump's department that. of homeland security right yeah if you want to believe them the number one threat is white supremacists um so I, you know, but we're at a point where, like, you know, I was I was hoping to well, get through the, to well, the 19-year-old who's voting for the first time. Well, tell me, wait, wait, I'm curious, though. I, I'm curious. What, um, what, 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 what is their reaction to 
his coronavirus response. You know, like, you know, politics aside, can you say to them, like, you know, this is. I, like, I can't, I just don't talk to my sister at this point because over the past several months, every time I express any sort of concern about coronavirus, she's like, oh, well, it's not as bad as they're saying. And like, she is, I, you know, use her Prime account to order groceries here um, and saw that she recently got a Trump train shirt and a Trump 2020 shirt and Trump sweatpants and Trump hats. And mm. like she is drinking the mother effing Kool-Aid. Um, and she's like, not doing that ironically, incidentally, right? No, is that what you're saying? Okay. Not at all. Um, like she is all aboard said train. Um, my mother, I think at this point may not vote for anyone when it comes to president and just vote down ballot. That's good. Um, which is, a, you know, I'll take it. Um, where does your family my, live? They live in central Florida. Okay. Um, not too far from Orlando. Um, but like in the country part of Florida where like I grew up on five acres in the middle of the woods in an unincorporated part of the county. Mm. So yeah. like it's not all beaches and Disney world. Um, and so like I, I came from a very country place. Um, and my, I've been trying to get through to my niece, but we're at the point now that my 19 year old niece who just recently voted for the first time in the primary is getting ready to vote in November. And she won't even discuss politics with me because she's quote unquote too opinionated. And apparently at 19, she knows exactly. How well, my, and like, I, like, I, like the lines of communication are just getting severed completely. And at this point, it's not so much about turning them around or anything. At this point, I'm just doing calculus of like, how, how much do I keep putting up with this? Because oh, I was going to say, uh, here's, I have an answer for you. I have an answer for you. I don't mean to cut you off, but we got to, we got to move forward. I have an, uh, have I just gotten disconnected? Son of a gun. I don't think they can hear me. Did I just get disconnected? Yes, I did. Son of a gun. Oh. They could take the answer off air. Uh, I, 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 I'm not even, I'm, I'm supposed oh. to go home for Christmas. No, okay. I got to interrupt you. I got to interrupt you because I got my, I got phone issues. So let me just, let me just give you the answer. Um, new time for new family. Appreciate the call. I mean, obviously I'm being a little uh, facile there with that, but uh, we're getting, I, I mean, I would just say like, you know, I, I would, uh, the, the best thing is just keep working on them. Don't, yeah. you don't, they're, they're, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have to put it on the clock. Maybe you can get that, but they don't, I think this is a multi-year project for your family. And yeah. I think when president cotton uh does the same thing in eight years from now you can see there's you can say see there's a pattern and then maybe uh, they will uh they will yeah you need an ally you're not going to be able to 12 angry men this thing no i don't think so yeah. well it's so uh, hard because you form your bonds with your family before you have politics before you could judge them for their politics so it's really hard for people most of the time when their families have terrible politics that are, you know, inhumane and disrespectful of human life. I mean, I, I, we don't know what the class background of this family is. It sounds like they're not in the ruling class, but um, maybe if the democratic party was in some way representative of their interests or had been, then it would be an easier case to make. Maybe like we don't have that, right now to test out but maybe we will in the future i i am increasingly of the mind that um there is going to be a significant percentage of the country that are going to be unreachable in terms of being um at least offered any of uh, these type of reforms and even then even if they're experiencing them um are going to be reluctant to um uh, to change their attitude towards these things. I mean, well, let's just, I mean, let's put it this way. We know 
that the Democratic Party is responsible for Social Security and Medicare, right? We, we know this. Um, these are both wildly popular programs. The Democratic Party, for an extended period of time, um, sort of lost touch with the idea that they were associated with so, uh, Social Security and, and Medicare. Um, and they recently... If- it, like if, if you're not poor enough to get uh, Medicaid and you're not old enough to get Medicare and Social Security, you don't really care about that. Well, that's true. I mean, you may not be aware that it's there for you and you may not appreciate it because it's not in your hand at that moment. But I mean, I'm just talking about the cohorts that do get it right. Paul Ryan got Social Security when his father died. Um, there are millions of people who are now getting Medicaid there are millions of people who are on Medicare. Medicaid pays for two thirds of the people in nursing homes in this country. They have kids, adult kids, who may not be eligible for Medicare yet, but they certainly know the implications of Medicare being, you know, taking care of their parents. And I would, I think off the top of my head, recipients of let's say Medicare and social security Older people, Biden's doing better with them now uh, than Trump has, but they certainly voted for Trump, I think, last time. And um, now part of that, I think, is a, a, a branding. Part of that is that the, you know, the, the Democrats didn't get a, so. But I don't know that there is a relationship between the fact that they are getting the most beloved government programs um, and their willingness to, to vote. I mean, I, again, I think that the Democrats should offer these things. And I think maybe m- arguably long time, uh, it is uh, over, over a long period of time with a, a certain amount of consistency, um, it, it will help. And maybe, maybe the reason why Democrats tend to get more votes, period, rather than win electoral votes, at least on a presidential level, and, and they get more votes actually in the Senate too. It's just that the Senate is the, devised in such a way that less votes. Maybe that's a function of Medicare and Social Security, the, the, the awareness that people have that the literally two most beloved government programs come from them. Um, well, here's, here, here's why I think that it could change back because it changed before, right? Like the working class by and large used to vote for the Democrats and then the primarily the white working class, although not exclusively white, shifted over time to uh, the Republican Party to the degree that, uh, you know, poor people vote, which, as we know, it's the demographic that votes the least. And we are only talking about the working class when we talk about this. Right. Because it makes sense that people with money would vote for Republicans forever. So it gives me a little bit of hope that it can be changed back again, although it might not be as easy as it was to uh, drift in the rightward direction, because it is a historical shift that has happened in a lot of these places used to be solidly blue counties. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it has to be structural policies. Like, I mean, I think people need more, frankly, leisure time uh, away from work to uh, consume information. You need to have complete like reform of, media monopolies and how people consume information. I think those things, like you basically, the ground has been cultivated to produce this sort of stuff. And the Democrats, my critique of them has always been that they think they can manage democracy when really you have to cultivate it actively. And I think that's really the problem. And I don't know if like any, like, I don't think campaign rhetoric is how you cultivate that. I think like, but I, I think, I think materially, uh, like putting money into people's hands uh, and redistributing, we'll do that over the long term. But more acute things like media monopolies and mm-hmm. you know that sort of stuff, I think needs yeah. to be addressed. And you know, for every good thing like social security that the Democrats have given folks, there's also something bad that they're also acutely aware of. Especially if you're talking about um, the Democrats who run local government in red states, although, you know, a lot of these local governments are captured by Republicans as well. Like they're not that different from Republicans, especially in these places. You want to talk about, um, I don't know, Joe Manchin or like, oh, who is the governor who switched parties? Who's the coal guy in, um, in Kentucky? But that guy won. 
Yeah. And Joe Manchin keeps winning. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't vote. A lot of the people that we're talking about don't vote, period. Right, I know. But, but if you're saying that people, the reason why Democrats don't do better is because people are mad at them because of what they do on a local level, you cited somebody who actually wins. All right. Well, maybe that's a bad example, but um, I'm going to come up with some more because I think that I'm right. I just can't I, prove it right now. I, I, I mean, I think that I think over time it is possible that uh, material benefits can influence, um, uh, you know, people's sort of like ideological foundations or, or reach through their the the media environments and 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 sort of like localized and by localized i mean like their family environments that they're yeah. issued in but i but i think there's a i think there's a big rural urban divide i think there is a um there is a big sort of um uh, you know we went through this yesterday with 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 thomas frank i mean i i am increasingly skeptical that um oh god that there is value in pursuing a lot of these uh, votes. I think that there is, I think we might, we do better, you know, um, trying to get people who don't vote um, out to the polls. We've seen like, you know, the disparity between 2016 and let's say 2012. And the question is, you know, how do we motivate those people? And it, it is, it, 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 it could be by offering more material benefit but I just think that, like, I'm sorry, if you're voting for Trump right now, I, I just think that, like, the attempts, I'm not saying that you should specifically, you know, I, I don't know what write them off means, you know, actually in practice. But I think that there is limited value. The return on investment is pretty low in terms of what you'd have to exert to get these people on board. I think this that is sort of permanent to American politics too, right? Yeah. Like you look at that book we we had a uh, that Nut Country by Edward Miller talking about Dallas um, in the when Kennedy went there and got shot basically and how insane it was. Like sex of insane ideologies are not new to this country. I mean, think of like the the lost cause myth and how widespread yes. that is, right? I mean, like, that, yeah, yeah th I mean that's that's I mean that's that that is the um, the, I mean, that is the issue. And, and I think we got a, uh, I am here and I think this is accurate. Uh, Disco Stu, can we stop saying the working class voted for Trump? It's simply not accurate. White people, rich and poor voted for Trump. Poor people voted for Clinton. Poor people chose Biden over Sanders. Denial does not help pr progressives. I, that's, that is accurate. The, if you want to look at the clear determinant factor in terms of, of, of Trump's support, it is white. The best way to find out if somebody um, uh, supported Donald Trump is to ask three questions. What are, are you white? What do you make in terms of you make, make a lot of money or where do you live? <laughs> and if you live in a rural area and you're white, you probably voted for Trump. If you live in uh, anywhere else and you're white and you make a lot of money, you probably voted for Trump. Um, that, that's true, but I would only add that if you're trying to see if someone voted or not, you would ask them different questions. And those questions have to do with uh, the number one thing, their income. And as we know, the poor and working class in this country skews non-white. Yes. No, I agree. I agree. Um, and, you know, it has vexed people for a long time. How do you get people who are on Medicaid to vote? Um, and I think, you know, part of it is there's a lot of obstacles that are put in the way of those people voting, which make it much harder than, you know, other people. Um, and those obstacles range from like no polling places to can't get the day off from work to no, no care for the children. Um, no fixed address. No fixed address. I mean, there's a ton of different yeah. uh, of, of, of elements. But yeah, I, I guess I think but both my, my point is specifically in terms of like those Trump voters. The, the, the figure that, that keeps resonating with me is um, I can't remember which uh, what, what book it was. Identity crisis. 50 percent of whites without a college degree. Thought up until 2008 when Obama won thought that the Republicans were to the left of Democrats on race. 
50% of non-college attending whites thought that the Republicans were to the left of Democrats on race in 2008. That is still the vestiges. And I would imagine many of those people come from the South um, where that was just sort of the heritage. That's why the South were virulently racist. That's Uh, why it was Bill Clinton and Al Gore, right? I mean, I feel like to kind of maintain that appearance. Yeah. Well, better late than never, I suppose. I don't know. I think there are uh, material helped. I don't think it helped Democrats (laughs) necessarily. Yeah, well, uh, uh, at least they know. At least they know what's going on. I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I think the material barriers to voting for poor and working class people are very real. Um, but it, it's hard to fully disaggregate them from the policy or ideological barriers, right? Because these are things that affect people's material lives. And they're going to need a lot more than Medicaid in order to, A, have more ability to vote and B, have more of a desire to vote, right? Yeah. Going back to that report that, um, was it Matt Taibbi did on how a lot of people who don't vote, yeah, there are there are real barriers to voting that are like, can't get to the polling place or whatever. There are also, there's also the fact that a lot of people don't want to vote. And those two things are connected. There was that Stan Greenberg um, thing in, about Wisconsin healthcare um, people upset about premiums, basically. I mean, I think that's the sort of thing that is important um, that mm-hmm. Democrats need to start doing. The irony is, is that that um, much of what would happened in 2011 with uh, Walker was a full on assault on WISCare, which was the Wisconsin um, uh, health care system. Right. But a lot of that like is um, that's in resent that builds resentment that built a resentment towards like public employees and stuff basically yeah. like the failure like if we just took healthcare off the table then a lot of that resentment wouldn't have been there um let's go to uh, brian kilmeade on fox and friends because donald trump is just not getting the credit he deserves uh, says brian kilmeade for a middle east i mean i put this in quotes peace deal uh, the reason why I put the peace in quotes is because these countries were not at war. Um, and they had basically normalized relations unofficially for years. Israel and the UAE and Israel and Bahrain. Uh, they got the green light from Saudi Arabia to make it more public. But this is not going to create any more peace. <laughs> um The Bahrainis and the UAE, they don't care about uh, the Palestinians. They don't care about that conflict. Um, I'm talking like broad, you know, broadly speaking in terms of their national interests. I think they're perfectly willing to allow for the status quo. Um, And these relations were pre-existing. It's just now they're official. So it's not really a peace deal per se, but even still, Brian Kilmeade knows how much anticipation there has been around this. The fear of Iran and their terrorist activities. It's the worry that America was leaving Israel and focusing on Iran that set the groundwork for allowing guys like Jared Kushner to get in there and say, listen, you know Israel's not your problem. I know there's trade going on. I know you're exchanging diplomatic, uh, diplomat, uh, diplomatic uh, cables. Why not just normalize relations? Why not send a message to Iran that they're not going to be intimidated? And now, instead of the Palestinians who never saw an opportunity they didn't want to walk away from, they now are left out in the cold because the other Arab nations were sick of the Palestinians walking away from every uh, overture. So now you have a situation where Oman, Sudan, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia all bless this move, which makes people say on the inside that they are set to sign on. So this, instead of being Palestinians, Israelis, this is more now about Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, and everybody else. And we'll see if uh, the Palestinians come aboard. So in other words, um, we have isolated the Palestinians. I don't think we're going to see Morocco and this and that, but the idea that people were anticipating this and this a peace deal, it's, it's just, it's being um, uh, so overstated. And all we're doing is bringing ourselves closer to the brink of war with Iran. Right. Uh, we had really made some inroads there. If we wanted to defuse the situation in the Middle East, uh, developing uh, relations with Iran was... Um, the way to do it that has been flushed down the toilet and i'll tell you something i 
I, I, I'm worried about, you know, what Donald Trump will do in the next uh, six weeks in terms of Iran as a way of trying to establish something. Um, they're going to pull everything out of the, the, the kitchen sink and that's in the kitchen sink, right? I mean, bombing Iran or doing something like that, that's in the kitchen sink without a doubt. It's a little bit scary. Yeah. Well, we know that Trump is kind of a coward, so that's good. I'm a little afraid. Can I be, if, can I go into a bunker if we do this? Oh, okay. Oh, I got my he, Bahrain now? Okay. He likes to send the tweets from, he wants to send the tweets from a bunker. He doesn't actually want to do wars. And that might be one of his few redeeming qualities. I'm I terrified. hope so. I'm terrified. I think we'll see. I gotta know. I'm terrified, but I also don't want to go to jail. So I'm weighing those things. Um, let's play this clip uh, where uh, was it Tucker that had Bernie Carrick on? Yeah, yeah. This is uh, Tucker Carlson having second. Bernie Carrick on. If you don't remember Bernie Carrick, uh, Bernie Carrick was the police commissioner under um, Rudy Giuliani, and when. George Bush was looking for a head of Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Giuliani said uh, Bernie Carrick. And then they had to vet Bernie Carrick and they got away from him very, very quickly. Uh, we found out why. They claimed at the time it was because of a nanny problem. He wasn't paying his nanny and giving them Social Security, which was uh, things were so quaint back then when that was not uh, celebrated, like you know, the gig economy that it is today. Um, but it turns out that, uh, oh, actually, he was receiving a lot of gifts from people who were happen to be mobbed up. <laughs> he had no idea. And he ended, up going, too. he ended up going to jail. But let's, by all means, have this guy uh, be our moral authority. Early 80s was responsible for over two dozen homicides, murders, assassinations, executions of cops around the country. That's what we're seeing right now. And who's pushing it? Black Lives Matter, Antifa, the creators of Black Lives Matter, um, are the Democrat-led cities by Marxist, left-wing, lunatic politicians who are saying nothing about it. You know, when you listen to what was said, especially by that mongrel thug that found it entertaining that these two had been shot you know and you listen to the democrats talking about reimagining the police well reimagine this reimagine that your communities where they are systemically slaughtering black men and women yeah. how about the men in those communities have chivalry and respect and discipline where they're not basically slaughtering or slaughtering their own and you're holding them accountable because that's what's going on and nobody's doing anything about it they all find this entertaining the bottom line is for all those people that's voting for the democrats in those cities and voting for joe all biden right. I, we don't need to hear anymore i mean obviously it goes on to say that you shouldn't vote for joe biden because the black men in these communities don't have the chivalry that they uh that they should have Oh, one other thing about Bernie Carrick that I thought was also very chivalrous that people should remember. <laughs> when 9-11 uh, happened, and, and, and for those of you who are too young to recall this, it was reported at the time, I think it was Wayne Barrett who reported this. Rudy Giuliani was given the option, I think it was by Bratton, and actually really pled with, to put his command center in Brooklyn. Um because it would be the safest place for it to be in the event that there was, let's say, a terrorist attack or some type of natural disaster in Manhattan. Rudy Giuliani did not want to do that. He wanted to put it into World Trade Center Tower 7, the command center. Uh, and the reason is, is because he was having an affair and wanted a crash pad. And so he ended up using that as a crash pad for the affair that he was having at the time. Now, of course, there was... Um, hundreds, uh, maybe thousands of gallons of diesel fuel in uh, World Trade 7. Uh, and uh, because, of course, you needed a command center to be able to function without power. And so it needed to have a massive generator that could uh, take care of itself for a long time. The other little known fact was there was, uh, after 
And of course, that's why they couldn't get to the command center. And that's why there was a breakdown in communications. Uh, it's impossible to sort of calculate how many first responders were lost because of that breakdown in communications. But after 9-11, there was an apartment uh, that was essentially the use of was donated to the city for the sake of of um, workers who were basically walking the pile, as they say, in 9-11, looking for survivors, cleaning up, combing through the uh, ruins. And Bernie Carrick, just because, you know, that seemed to be what was happening uh, in his crew, he used that apartment for his own purposes to maintain his affair with Judith Regan, who was a right-wing publishing uh, sort of, I guess, magnet or, uh, I don't know, um, the, the, you know um, I don't know what you would call her, but she was a, she was, a, she was pub, a pub, uh, the publisher of Regent, I think it was, is the, uh, and they would publish all the right-wing things and he was having an affair with Judith Regan and that's what they used that apartment for. Sorry, workers combing through the pile we're having our affair. We can't be bothered to get our own apartment. This one will work. Um, so the guy getting on there and telling black men that what they need to do is become more chivalrous is uh, just beyond the pale. I guess maybe that's what he meant. Is that chivalry? Jamie, let's say you're dating somebody and they say, hey, I have access to a free apartment that's actually supposed to be for uh, rescue workers for this horrific tragedy that has befallen. <laughs> I get access to it. And would, you, would your response be, ah, oh, finally a man who knows the chivalry is not dead? I mean, yeah, you get kissing up frogs, you find a prince. Honestly, <laughs> you, you imagine chivalry in the Middle Ages. It's like, hey, I'm a knight. I got uh, you know, a crash pad in the Tower of London. Uh, if you want to come up there and join me. So it, maybe he's right, actually. Maybe he's a very chivalrous guy. Oh, well, then fair, fair enough. Um, 9-11 was a very scary time, Sam. I think you'd understand if you were there. That's, that is true. I would have a better sense of that uh, at the time. Were I there? Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Um, <laughs> there is a... Let, well, there, I guess there is a there is this massive like sort of still a cohort of people who are just convinced that COVID is I don't know fake, and that they don't need to wear a mask to protect uh, themselves or anybody else. What's this? Uh, what is this? Where's this one from? The first w one here will be from Florida, and it looks like a bunch of people <laughs> running through a Target, um, basically trying to free everyone from being sheep. Hmm. Bunch of college kids. That is, um, that is really sweet. Matt, why don't you Google um, the, uh, the wedding that took place in Maine? Seven people died from the 65, uh, because 65 guests went there and they got into a church. Um, I think there were hundreds of people who contracted COVID out of that um, get together. And ultimately seven of them died. Uh, it is a uh, main wedding reception now linked to deaths of seven people who didn't even attend. Jeez. What do you like, you know, what you, you know, how long it would take you in the context of that marriage to think about your wedding and know <sighs> that seven people died as a function of that reception that you were so adamant about. I mean, and, some people uh, almost died at my wedding reception, but that was due to their own bad choices. That's probably true. Yes. I mean, yeah. the, the, you know, look, wearing a mask is a pain in the ass. It's creepy. It's uncomfortable. And, 
it's it is this is a really crappy crappy time um but there is something so disturbing and it, it, you know uh, Florida, there was, I, I saw video footage the other day of a cop going into a, um, sometimes I don't think it was, this is like an off campus housing. And there was like three or four guys, college students sitting on the, on the porch. And they had like 15, 20 people in their house. It was a big house. I don't know if it was a frat, but it sort of like had that quality about it. So the cops like, look guys, you're not supposed to do this. And you're supposed to, you know, 10 people is the max. And the kid's like, oh, I'm sorry. And, and the cop says, give me your ID. I'm going to run it. He comes back out of the car and the cop says, do you, do you have COVID? Because it's coming up that you have COVID. And he says, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I tested positive. And the cop's like, you know, you're, you're supposed to be quarantining. He's like, well, I'm not leaving the house. And then the cop's like, but there's 25 people that you brought over into the house. What, what's the story with those guys sitting on the porch? Oh, they all have it too. And what about the 10 or 15 people that are in that? And the cop is just like, he doesn't even know how to react to this. This level of like, I don't know if you could call it stupid, stupidity, or just like, will it, like this ignorance and this sort of just fundamental lack of understanding that we are connected as people. And I think that is what's really dangerous about those people walking down that aisle in target i don't know if somebody's going to catch covid there but it is basically just a way of saying like we don't care like we're not willing to do anything for the sake of the community for the sake of people we don't know like we're we're so totally just islands um unto ourselves that literally we can't even pass germs. Do you think those people think that it's real? Because if they think it's not real, then the whole different calculation. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how you would come to the conclusion that it's not real. It's 200,000 people have died. Now, I guess maybe you could say that's not real. I don't know how people say that the earth is flat. I mean, look, I don't know. Do I know that the earth is round? Can I like say like, look, I can show you the certain, you know, I can show you the, the, the bent. Like, I don't know. I mean, I just, there's been a substantial amount of scientific consensus that the world is round. And so I, that's what I, I, I buy into. Um, but I can't, you know, and, and, and I do that. I buy into that consensus because like, I have a certain amount of faith in, you know, like uh, broadly society and humanity. And I think these people don't. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, you know, but at the same time, they're going to enjoy all the benefits of society. They're going to enjoy, they're going to enjoy it as they march down that target, that hallway in target or whatever it is. I mean, it's just, it really is stunning. We uh, have another one with a woman from Calgary at a, a fabric store and the Zia Tong, a Canadian journalist, says she is a QAnon um, for her social media post. If you let's watch be that clear. One. This is there's QAnon in Canada. Uh, yeah, so I, it's in Germany, this, too. Let me just say this to Canada right now. If there's any Canadians listening. And this is the trade I will make. I'm going to give you this piece of advice. The piece of advice is build a wall. <laughs> build a wall. And my, and what I want in return, sponsor me for, you know, at least like some type of uh, permanent residency, just as an option, build a wall, put a little bit of like a hole in it, go due north of where I am now. And I will meet you there mm -hmm. when I send out a signal. Well, it sounds like it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. Well, that's, it could be too late. It's Let's... spreading. It's already spread to Canada. Oh God. Here, sorry, here she Canada. is. here because I'm sick and tired of your second rules. All right, sweetheart. We don't like to. I, do you think I want to wear a Yes, I do. Yes, I, I do not want to wear You are ashamed. I have to wear Just like the rest of them. Why don't you people you educate yourselves? You need to How am I doing? Am I critic you? You're really close to Are me. you afraid? 
I, you should run away. I don't like what you have. You your are. super mask on. I'm trying to protect you. <laughs> I don't need protection from you. Oh, you just touched me. I oh really wish no, you I touched you. I, I'm gonna I, get COVID. Go. No, you're probably going to give it to me. <laughs> are you going to leave? Look at you. Are you going to leave the store? 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 And aggressive to another you customer. Know. Would you please leave? I'm aggressive? Would you I please can't. leave? Okay. No. The thing I wanted to leave? say, which you wouldn't let me say, you all oh, see my face. Right? When you, when oh, I, when I, when I, if I ever come back here again, uh -huh. and this thing Please is critically I want an apology from each and every one of you. See. Yeah, Educate yourself. Yeah, because somebody knows is sick, and then you will see how much Nobody is sick, sweetheart. Go for it. Go for it. Educate yourself. Please leave. Go online. Please leave. And now. read and learn. You all win. You all win. You know what I would have done if I was working at that store? I mean, this is this is why I can't work at a retail outlet, particularly in this time. I would have just said, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, just bye. Or... Bye. Bye. Uh... I just like thinking like you're sheep, you're wearing masks, you're being completely like subjugated. It is, it, it, you know, uh, around my neighborhood in Brooklyn, the mask wearing is well, and and, and up in in the country too. In 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 the in the county I'm in, there are I think today zero new cases. I think there's been zero new cases for days. Maybe over the past like two weeks, there's been three new cases out of like a county of sixty thousand people. But everybody wears masks. I mean, you know, when you're out like outside in the country and you're, 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 you know, you're distanced, people are not and they're working or something like that. But for the most part, everybody's wearing masks because there's this understanding of like, I might not need this mask right in this instance, but I can't tell which instances I'm going to need the mask. And until we are really clear of this, this is what's going to prevent a resurgence. And, and the idea that that's like, being like a sheep as opposed to sort of like concern for the broader community is so disturbing. Like that, that lady is out of her mind because even if, even if what she says is true, right? Even if like, fine she wants to believe like look i've i've had the opportunity to to uh to to really search this online and i mean like i i just like compared to like during the bush years i would go to dinner parties and people who would have you know who are or people who are you know uh simpatico politically and they would have no idea about what was going on with the bush administration they didn't want to know they really didn't want to know and uh, the idea that i would have gotten i'm going like you sheep like just like being such an a-hole about it. If she wants to be the keeper of the secret information that she doesn't need to wear a mask in these stores, how about this? Just wear the mask and then take it off when you get out and just be like, society, can you get over these people? I can't believe it. It's just like, why be such like a, like a, an a-hole unless you're really out of your freaking rocker. And in that case, like we have a lot of those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are certain social codes that uh, you got to be kind of nuts to break, whether you respect them or not. And then when you see someone else breaking them on the subway or whatever, you just hope that another crazy person comes along to defeat them. Yeah, it, it's it's disturbing. It's really disturbing. I mean, and there's definitely a double standard too. like I hate smug liberals and I don't think that's helping our side at all. But it does strike me as odd that uh, conservatives can be as smug as they want. And that doesn't seem to be a problem for anyone. Right. Somehow that smugness. There's nobody saying, like, that's why Donald Trump gets less votes. <laughs> there's, you know, like, when was the article? When was even the meme? Like, hey, those dicks walking down the, uh, the store in Target in Florida. That's why Donald Trump got three million less votes. than Hillary Clinton. 
never mind what Barack Obama got. We don't, I, has anyone ever heard that take? Like, hey, those guys being a holes is what it's, it's, yeah. Let's go to the IMs, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I may try the phones in a second, but I, I, I've got good news. We're going to have a uh, better internet uh, by Friday. That is the plan, anyways. And so um, I'll, I'll be able to take some calls, but let me do some uh, IMs Boy. and then, then I'll try some calls. Just in time for Virgil. He loves dealing with the public. Of course. Science people don't care about your feelings. To be fair, it's the PCR test uh, required the day week turnaround and are typically much more reliable and have much lower false uh, response rates due to internal standards uh, used. Antibody tests are rapid and can be done on site without a lab, hence the appeal. It also seems to be the type the White House uses, which is idiotic because it takes typically one to three weeks post-infection to mount an antibody response, but oh well, maybe science doesn't know. Um, what's a wet ass proletariat? <laughs> Why don't we see Jamie and Matt debate anyone from the right? They should be pressured from all angles, and it feels like the left just doesn't want to get into the arena. They're uh, they're giving ground to the right. Um, somebody said it before. No Mickey, like you say, Toby, Keith, no me, no me Keith, no Mickey, you boomer. Hmm. I'll do it uh, if Matt does it first. Yeah, I don't run away from debates, but I mean, it's, I got a lot on my plate. So, <laughs> Matt, where are you talking from? That sounded weird. I'll debate Clay Travis. Oh, yeah, my mic is having issues. Apine, ap, apneva. Uh, hey, hey, snack bar Sam, can I get a belated birthday show far for my fellow Virginian and MR member, Scott? My dude is out in the sticks working the census, doing his part as always for our democracy. Oh, uh, in that case, definitely. Dab one, it's just like the Nazi camps. Uh, that's who you're talking about, the hysterectomies. Uh, I, I mean, like I say, we need more reporting on that, but it, 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 it is very reminiscent of that indeed. And, and unfortunately, there's also a long history of that happening here. Yes, I mentioned um, there's a there's a Supreme Court case. The name of it. I want to say like Buck, something like that. Oliver Wendell Holmes. So it must have been like maybe the twenties or something, where it was, it was found to be legal for uh, to give hysterectomies to women in um, in institutions without their consent. Rabbit from Boston. Hey, Sam and MR crew, what do you all think about post-growth degrowth policies in terms of combating climate change as opposed to the new, the Green New Deal, green growth paradigm? If you're unfamiliar, I would definitely recommend having Jason Hickel on the topic. And personally, I'd love to see him interviewed on the show. I mean, uh, I think it's hard to conceive of, of how we can have a a growth paradigm in terms of expansion of the economy and be able to, to deal with this. But I also, um, I believe that I, I just believe that the, the, the fastest route to any meaningful change is going to, um, is going to be more targeted than that. And that, and that you need to sort of weaken some of these uh, obstacles. Um, and, and it would also give you time to assess during there. I mean, I think there's other reasons to not have, be stuck in a sort of growth oriented economy. Um, I think there's other benefits to it, but I just not, not sure politically um, that we can go from here to there. I mean, I'm honestly not sure who I believe at this point, because we've heard from experts who think that you can have uh, growth, uh, capitalist expansion, and at the same time, uh, green the economy and fix climate change. Um, and then I've heard from experts who I respect an equal amount who say that there's absolutely no way to do that. And the only way to solve climate change is by degrowth and ultimately overturning the capitalist system because as we know, the system needs to grow or everything falls into crisis. So I have no idea at this point in time, but that doesn't change my resolve to end capitalism. 
Guess I, I mean, I, I'm with you on that. And I think, it, it, but my, so I will defer to whatever can happen quicker. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And uh, cause if we've got a mistake to make, I want to make it as soon as possible. Yeah. Let's put well, it that way. We're not going to end capitalism in the next 10 years and something has to happen not on the front of climate Jamie. change in the next 10 years or else we're pretty screwed. So whatever certainly, you say, sheeple. certainly in the short term, green new deal, long term, destroy the economy, Sheep abolish the value form. Sheep sheepdog alone. Jamie. So, so, sorry if that makes me uh, if that makes me a sheepdog lib. <laughs> sheepdog. Hey, Sam and crew, I was listening to Democracy Now! yesterday and basically listed all the tactics the Republicans are employing to steal this election from invalidating vote by mail, causing confusion, sending corrected ballots in other states, I don't remember which, where the voters would have to make sure to use the correct ballot because they sent more than one in disenfranchising convicts in Florida with poll taxes. Yep. My question. Let's say Joe Biden loses. Where should people draw the line accepting the results of the election? I mean, I know they're basically cheating their way to win this if elections worked. I mean, this is what my issue was with the um, the Green Party holding up the ballot in Wisconsin, um, even giving them the benefit of the doubt just because of their sheer incompetence as a political. I mean, not even sheer political, like just sheer like tying their shoes competence. Um you know, and then their willingness at that point to um, to well, to, to to suppress the vote for the benefit of whatever it is that they think they're doing, uh, which is, you know, obviously not to, to win. And they're not going to get five percent at this point. We see the results I mean, um, at this point. <laughs> exactly. But uh, but that is an example. Of what you're talking about. Because how do you get people mad in 45 days about those four or five days that were lost in terms of turning the ballots around? You know, in Wisconsin, you're talking about a 20,000 20, vote difference. How many thousands of votes will not be counted because of that five or six or week long delay? I don't know. But it's going to be greater than zero. And then how do you get mad 45 days later about something like that? A bad enough to go out in the streets. I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer yet for that, uh, to be honest with you. And it's something that like I'm trying to work through and I'm not sure who I want to talk to about it. And if there's multiple people I want to talk to on the show about it. Um, but it, it, it is, I, I mean, it is a, it is a, it, 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 it literally is keeping me up at night. I'm, I, you know, like, like, like gulping CBD now, <laughs> gulping it. They should make it in a bigger size for you. That's right. Like, I, I want to write to the Sunset Lake CBD guys and be like, hey guys, uh, how about instead of upper bottles, I mean, how like, about like, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. What about those big, like water things that they, they, like they use in coolers, something like that. And if you can put a nipple on that, that might work for yeah. me. Just, just fill one of uh, Pretty Bad Lefty's water jugs with CBD. Amy Jean, I highly recommend the film No Mas Bebes. Uh, tells the story of Mexican-American women who were sterilized while giving birth in Los Angeles during the 60s. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Silver this ball happened stud. very recently. Yep. yep. A silver ball stud. Sam, crew, Vouch debated what must be the last remaining libertarian who I guess is also running for president. Libertarians avoid answering questions with greater fervor than they argue against taxation. Uh, indeed. Uh, Avis uh with regard to your imagine if Al Gore had won hypothetical from yesterday, you might be right that he would have implemented market reforms that would have been better compared to the Bush administration on climate change. Well, I, I think that's un, 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 undoubtable. I mean, uh, Bush was horrible on climate change. I mean, just just horrible. Uh, but you don't get to pick and choose what affects a president a president's election has. Okay. Um, you want me to add the invasion of Iraq? Because even if the Democrats wanted to, the Republicans wouldn't uh, have gone for that uh, because the Democrats wanted to. Gore's Democratic Party, by being accountable to a business constituency invested in not destroying the power of the fossil fuel industry, means that the same forces that bring us a Republican wave every four to six years would still have had the resources to roll his still partial and insufficient changes back 
in just the way that Trump has done to Obama's changes. Yeah, wrong. Um, the way that people say just the way when talking about these extremely like complex variables is really telling, I think. It, yeah, but also this is an this is I'm quite sure that um, if Gore was able to do anything, and I think at that time he would have been, um, it would have been statutory. In terms of Obama, the things that Trump has done in terms of rolling back Obama stuff, it was all narrowly tailored regulatory things and things that that Obama didn't do until his third or I mean, excuse me, his uh, seventh or eighth year in office. And because of a law that allows Congress to undo these executive orders. Um, so it's just you're, you're comparing apples to oranges. The better example would be Trump's inability so far to fundamentally unwind the Affordable Care Act. Now, we know the flaws involved in the Affordable Care Act, but imagine if we had the Affordable Care Act 20 years ago instead of six years ago implemented 20 years ago, where would we be now in terms of the argument of needing better health care? <laughs> right? Like, like it would have been, I, like, I'm quite convinced if you go 20 years out from the Affordable Care Act, we're going to have significantly better, depending on what happens on this election, we're going to have significantly better health care. Will we have a single payer? Conceivably, maybe not, but, but certainly broader access and cheaper access for everybody uh, 20 years out. If Al Gore had been able to implement even the most uh, rudimentary, you know, um, climate change, um, at least created a framework from 20 years ago, even if it was like, we're going to invest heavily in solar or, or battery technology, or I don't know what the, the silver bullet would have been. Uh, or, or not even a silver bullet, but like even like a slight bullet, we would be 20 years ahead of the game than where we are now. Um, I think maybe, it's a, I think it's a coping even further than that. You maybe even mean further than that because it, it's not, I mean, it's possible it, everything else would be the same except for, you know, those things would have been implemented, but it's also possible that living with 16 years of these changes would have made people say like, I guess these stories that were being told about climate change are not necessarily true. I mean, who knows what would have happened with that trajectory, but they called them Bandar Bush for a reason, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, he was an oil man. Cheney was an oil man. Uh, I mean, literally. And so um, I, I just think that like comments like that are just, it's just, bizarre to me like the the whatever's going on inside of you that made you feel like you had to come because that's not even like like i would question even like your response like well it is the case that maybe uh that maybe gore would have made a difference in terms of climate change but that some of that could have been undone that's conceivable but if that's the first place where your mind goes and then you have to construct a fake analogy to what Obama did. I think you really got to sort of examine like what it is that is motivating your reasoning. Like, what is it that you need to believe? Because I don't look, I voted for Nader in that election. Now I vote swapped with people in Florida, supposedly. And I was in New York. So I don't, you know, like, I'm skeptical of Al Gore. I remember Tipper Gore. I remember, like, I, I am, you know, you can go back to 2004 and, 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 and listen to, like, what my feelings were about Al Gore. But, like, you got to ask yourself today, like, what it is that you're trying to, what, real, what reality are you trying to create in your head? to be that confident and that's what your takeaway is from that. 
I think it's increasingly a defense mechanism because of how crappy things are that you want to balance these equations like this. Like, I mean, I was reading Nelson Mandela's autobiography and he's talking about um, the election between General Smuts and uh, D.F. Milan, which the ANC was banned from participating in, actually does have ramifications, even though like you meaning that you prefer Smuts over the nationalists, because even though Smuts is a white supremacist, he's not as bad as the nationalists. And I just every time I see something like that, I think of one of those people going up to Mandela and talk, telling him he's too focused on, you know, the levers of power and that he needs to get real about revolution. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there is this sort of like, you know, a default like this. I don't know if it's full on nihilism. That is some type of response, like nothing matters, like marginal differences yeah. are irrelevant, that that even if they're not marginal differences, they're going to be unwound. I, I mean, I just think that that is, um, you know, obviously we can't prove any of this, right? I mean, you can't prove any of it. There's no, you, your statement, except for the fact that you you an, a, 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 analogized it to um, to Obama your statement could be correct. The, that part is, is simply just wrong. But your statement could be correct. We don't know, right? It's impossible to prove a counterfactual. Sure. There, uh, I don't even know if I want to wade into this, but I do think there is a lot of evidence that in the long term, in the long term, we cannot un the world without ending capitalism and transitioning to socialism. However... Uh, in the short term, we're doing a different calculation. Well, I mean, look, I, I don't but know. But like I said, like about Mandela, the people who have the power in like impact that struggle just fundamentally, they do. They 100% do. There's no revolutionary who would tell you the opposite. And, I don't think. And like, there, are, there, are some, there are steps on the way to there. And I happen to think that in the US in particular, um, we are never going to have a socialist revolution if we don't deal with racism first and that is the order of operations and you know the two kind of go together but also it's like how do you unite the working class but, when but, it's been artificially divided along lines of race and gender and all this stuff i i, I mean i i'm just talking about how like i i this 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 compulsion to say that um that nothing that there that, that nothing could matter in our politics right like i'm sorry like i don't know what has to happen that we could change something that's going to make it permanent right there is no permanence well, of anything i mean like and, and well you gotta you gotta create the irreversible sam and, and but yeah, uh, what is show me the example of the irreversible thing in the history of man well we haven't done it yet and if right. we do, it'll okay. be the greatest achievement in okay. human history. I mean, I That's would say that the transition from feudalism to capitalism was pretty irreversible. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. Tell <laughs> Peter Thiel about that. <laughs> well, for, uh, for now, uh, you, you anyway. Wanna, you want to put a bet as to, uh, you know, like, I think it's pretty 50-50 uh, feudalism or uh, uh, communism in this country. I would say I would, I would weigh a little bit closer to feudalism, uh, frankly. It'll be neo-feudalism. It'll be different. A slightly different feudalism, right? Yes, nothing is exactly the same, but also nothing is permanent. I want horses, and and so <laughs> I, I think like, you know, the idea that we could, you know, that 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 something is irreversible is 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 ridiculous. But the idea that um, you know nothing matters, you know, is really just a way of just sort of it, it, it really is just motivated reasoning. Yeah, I mean, I agree with certain like the anti-reform thing. I think instead of doing the type of bank reform we did basically 90 years ago, we just went to postal banking. That would have been huge for, you know, uh, not letting these people claw their way back. And I think that is, an, I, I mean, that's why I consider myself a socialist is I do think um, if you leave these things to themselves, they are going to, mm -hmm. you know, claw themselves back. But that none of these things don't make a difference. I think it's where people go. We did have postal banking. No, but I mean like you, they could have totally like, completely wiped out i mean that but that's the point is that we did have postal banking and they wiped it out i mean that there there's it's always going to be a constant struggle i think not uh, if I we think, expropriate them and take away their power forever 
that's true. But then you're going to have a new set of people who are going to, I mean, you know, you're going to have a new set of people who are going to have power. There's going to be power is going to rest somewhere. Yeah, it's and, going to rest in the the larger population in a very democratic and socialist way. Okay. In the interim, uh, before we get there, I mean, if that's happening on Thursday and everybody, or, you know, uh, on Friday of this week and everybody gets that, or even if it's there's a day when that happens, there's going to be an interim period and somebody's going to go the other direction. My point is there's always got to be vigilance. You've always got to push back on this stuff until we get to the utopia where all of a sudden everybody has an equal amount of shower of power and that creates a, a perfect tension and there is nobody um, and, and everybody is like-minded in that way. But until that day, um, and I'm quite confident I will not be around to see that. So you'll have to tell my grave that I was wrong about whether that shows up. Don't but, worry. I will. I, well, I'm also not convinced that you're going to be around when that happens either. I know you're younger mm -hmm. than me, but not that much younger. Um, and, but the bottom line is like, there is this, this, um, there is this tendency on the left to say that nothing, you know, nothing matters. Nothing will make a difference that even marginal difference can't. And I just don't think that's the case. Um, I just don't think that that's the case. And I just think that we can't prove it one way or another. And so if you want to actually bring about change, it is just the most rational choice to make at that point to believe that it does make a difference, that there are some things you can do that can make a difference. There's things you can do that, that are wrong, that are mistakes. But the idea that nothing matters as a belief mechanism is completely disempowering. That doesn't mean that everything matters. It just means that we may not be able to assess which of those things do matter. And so the idea is do as much of them as possible and hope for the best outcomes. But to sit back and say, it wouldn't make a difference when you really can't know that is stupid and disempowering. Well, I'd like to see an example of who used that model to the best effect. Like what, uh, whose fo footsteps are they following in? What political thinker that actually changed anything in this world basically just had that approach? I'd be curious. Steve John, Johnsburg. Mm. <laughs> um, My ghost is going to tell your ghost that I told you so. Someday when full communism is achieved. I promise. Well, uh, and, and, and won't we have learned, uh, uh, developed a way to resurrect everyone at that point anyways? Mm. Maybe. Call him, from a, call him from a 510 area code. Who's this? Uh, this is Marcus. I'm calling from Oakland, California. Marcus, you are on limited time until I get dropped off this phone because that's the way it works All around right. here. What's up? I'll make this really quick then. Besides the fact that you guys are awesome and keep up the great work, um, I just really wanted to bring up the fact that um, during the period of the 1930s to the 1970s, approximately one third of the female population of Puerto Rico was sterilized. Mm. Um, uh, it affected my family. My grandmother was one of those people. And they did things like uh, tell everybody to bring an overnight bag, all the factory workers, because they were going to go to uh, overnight at the hospital for a routine checkup, and they would leave the hospital without a uterus. Oh, so anyway, geez. maybe look into that and uh, the history that needs to be known. Oh, thank you, Marcus. I appreciate that. Horrible. Keep up the good work, guys. Thank Thanks. You. Horrible. Horrible. Calling from a 931 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello. Hello. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Sam, this is Ty from Tennessee. Ty from Tennessee. What's on your mind? Got to be quick because I may lose you. Okay. Uh, so you were actually on the Joe Rogan show, but in secret. Hmm. Uh, once upon a time, it was last week with Tim Kennedy's 9-11 podcast. Yeah. You uh, you and Nomiki, whenever uh, – well, actually, Joe Rogan was talking about it. He was talking about this dummy who was <laughs> insinuating that China was cloning people. And I was thinking, hmm, that's a pretty high-level idea. Yes. So <laughs> I saw yeah. that clip. We played that clip on the show the other day. Uh, oh, and dear. yeah. And then they got stuck on like Nomi saying that they should be deplatformed. And I think Nomi yeah. was probably being somewhat facetious on some level, but I also, I did, I forgot that the first part of that clip was them being COVID deniers. 
And using yeah. like China's ability to clone dogs or something is some explanation as to why the COVID was, I can't remember the exact clip. Um, and so I, I suspect that Nomi was only being, you know, I don't know, three quarters facetious or one quarter facetious, but whichever. Uh, I do genuinely appreciate um, Rogan making the point that Dave Rube's an idiot and using me to do it. I mean, that is, that's like me winning an Oscar or an Emmy or something like that, or, or an well, SB. Or it like almost feels like Emmy. he's sending a message to Dave with that. Yeah. He's like saying, <laughs> Dave, not only am I going to call you an idiot, I'm going to make, I'm going to use Sam Cedar in a way to make <laughs> you feel bad about yourself. In some ways, I almost think it's too cruel. <laughs> but right. I appreciate you telling me about it because it brings me an endless amount of joy. I'm sorry, folks, if you feel like yeah. I'm a bad person now. Yeah. Good looking Thanks out. For the call. Yep. Uh, call him from a 931 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 931. 931. Call him from a 931. Call from a 931 area code. Who's this? Where you calling from? Maybe I got dropped. 931. 931. Did I get dropped? 931. 931. Did I get dropped? Did I get dropped? Uh, no, I didn't. No. 931 got dropped. Uh, call from an 864. 864. Call from an 864. 864. Hi, this. Hey, Sam. Yeah. Hi, this is Glenn from South Carolina. Glenn from South Carolina. We only have a short period of time because my phone system stinks right now. Yeah, I got a phone thing. Yeah, I was watching uh, Brett Weinstein's show yesterday. Oh, jeez. Why? And I don't like Brett Weinstein. I guess, like, I don't understand, like, what's wrong. Because, like, he was, like, talking about the election. And he's, like, going on about, like, the unity thing. Where they're, like, I guess, like, running a third party, but, like, still. And, like, he was saying on the show that he's, like, not going to vote for Trump. and But then he said he's, like, not going to vote for Biden. And it's, like, yeah. he's supposed to be, like, a science guy. Like, well, well not, supposed to be. Let me let me more. let me let me explain what's going on there with with uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can I can explain this. The question is, why is this guy pushing his unity party five weeks out from an election when it is absolutely impossible for this person to win? It's probably also even impossible for it to implicate the election in any way. Why is he? That's well, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because he is a charlatan and he is selling a product which he hopes will make people perceive him in a certain way when either Biden or Trump is elected. It's literally a way of taking a position without having to take a position and allowing him to pivot in either direction after the election. I mean, these guys are such hucksters. It's, yep. it's it is, I mean, look, we're in the same business on some level, but I'm doing this because I believe in a set of politics and he is doing it because he believes in himself. And, and he wants to, in, it, I, I don't look, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor or a dentist for that matter. Um, I can't read a stupid asshole. That well, I can, <laughs> that I feel confident. In <laughs> that I do feel confident. I appreciate the call. I definitely but feel, thanks, I, I, I definitely feel uh, that I have the expertise to make that assessment. Remember um, this. Kanye tweets out on July 4th, we must now realize the promise of America by trusting God, unifying our vision, and building our future. I am running for president of the United States. Brett says bingo with a you know, uh, lightning emoji. Seriously, though, Kanye, please contact me. And if you look at this, I'm pretty sure Brett is one of the first responses. Uh, that's not in that one, but oh, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> he, likes to, he likes to say bingo at Kanye. <laughs> they're jersey. They're, they're, they're like... Uh, they're clout chasers is what they are. Oh right? my God. It really is embarrassing. Right? It's so embarrassing. And that's what, that's what, that's what uh, Ruben used to do. Remember Dave Ruben used to do that too. Like he would just be like, Oh yeah. You know, um, I don't know who, like some famous person would say like, Oh, we should, and he goes, I would love to discuss that with you on my program. And, yeah. Buddha gag or whoever. Right. right. Uh, okay. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> like it's just, 
Billy Bragg. Remember oh, the Billy Bragg thing? Excuse me. I am a person who has an opinion on that. So maybe you'd like to come on my show and discuss my opinion about what you just said. <laughs> I mean, it's yes, the Billy Bragg thing with Eric Weinstein was was pretty pretty rich. And incidentally, Eric, I should tell you that uh, Billy Bragg, I did see him at a talk after you tweeted that. And I think he thinks that you are too afraid to actually have a real debate. In fact, I know that. To be fair, he didn't use those words. He used the words about a uh, body part that he suggested that you were uh, reminiscent of. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't do. He didn't do. It came on our show, though. He did. He did. Discussed all kinds of ideas. Check all out this of thread ideas. Eric put on while we're on this. Um, he, <laughs> I just want to share this picture. So uh, let me go to this thread, actually, because he posted this picture himself. Um, it's this big thread about how nobody's taken the IDW seriously. But look at this. He actually made this himself. And I can't tell if. He's trying to make like this. We, Sam Harris, the idiotically named IDW, are still here. Wait, wait, which so the wait Weinstein's second. named? But 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 first of all, they named it, and if it's the if the name is stupid, like then who are the we? You know what I mean? It's like the one like sort of uh, uh, element that 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 supposedly they represented was that they couldn't say things without getting too much pushback. And um, let, here, go back. And so he, we, is that really his account? That's really his account. <laughs> we were mostly the non, but we're, we're here as we're, we're flawed, have monetary incentives and are fractured. What? Yeah, just insane. We're here as a force for unity. We were mostly the non-kleptocratic center left boring if you like <laughs> academic what? what but every one of us wore a target to thwart collapse i like how jordan peterson is dressed up like a wizard <laughs> you know how absolutely sort of megalomania like the megalomania i don't want a piece of the action thus i'm out so that i can say this Draft those who stood outside the duopoly. Look for people who put themselves physically at risk to talk reason. Stop bitching about the fact that everyone needs to feed families. Or oh, what the? This guy's going. This is an episode. This guy's he's having so, an episode. He's right? so bad at this. He, he was tweeting out NWA. Oh, this is. Uh, is this it? Uh, no, I can't tell. He was tweeting out uh, NWA lyrics very bizarrely the other day too, saying like they're, we were we laughed at it in the nineties. Articles of unity were suspended or something. Oh yeah, yeah. What? Why? Why was that? Why was their articles of unity suspended? I haven't looked into it. Um, I I, there, I think there's something really wrong with them. Um, and I think. Oh, you think? Way- yeah, I, didn't. That's... I think the worst thing that happened to them is just that, that like their 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 Patreon account must have stalled or something. I, I would also just say that if the first guest of my podcast uh, kept getting his ties to white nationalists documented in the press, I would probably address that and not just move on to different topics. And re- oh, you're talking about Peter Thiel? Of... I'm talking about Peter Thiel. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder because Eric still works for him, right? Yep. I wonder if that's upsetting to Eric. Maybe I should ask him. I wonder if it's upsetting or if it's news. I'm not sure. I wonder. Yeah, I wonder, like, you must be shocked. Is that weird for you to work for someone who's been hanging around with with avowed white supremacists? If Curtis Yarvin said he's fully enlightened, he's just not showing it all. What, What does that mean? I'd like to see Eric ask Peter Thiel about what Curtis Yarvin is reported to say about it. It feels like he could get him on the show at any time. That would be a good opportunity to, to, to like break some news. You want to talk yeah. about a Patreon explosion? How about doing that story? Yeah, that would be interesting. And then, um, and then, and then Jimmy Dore can tell us why having Peter Thiel on the Supreme Court wouldn't be that big of a deal. We'd get over it. Anyway, anyway. The, all right, the, well, these. These people just want affirmative action for bad posters. <laughs> they cannot handle the fact that they are bad at posting and other people are better and they want uh, a little affirmative action on their behalf. Um, 
Did Taibi endorse the Unity Commission? I find that hard to believe. Uh, what's, the he, commission? what's the commission? Is there he, no commission? He was on uh, the Dark Horse podcast, basically the day that Brett t- t- or a day after Brett tried to fire me, and uh, I mean Brett gave him the very uh, uh, thousand ten thousand foot view of it, and Taibi said, "Yeah, it sounds you know pretty interesting." He's so. been doing I'm stuff sure like was, that I'm these sure days. Was, I'm sure it was. I'm, I, I hope it was one of those things like, hey, man, do you want to be part of my uh, my time machine? Um, uh, party? <laughs> sure. <laughs> eh, he signed Whatever. the Harper's letter. Me and him got to have a talk. Taibi signed the Harper's letter? Yeah. Did he know that they excluded Greenwald because they didn't like Greenwald's politics? <laughs> oh, well, actually, they no, he knows because him and Halper were the ones that broke that story. Uh, with uh, Thomas Chatterton Williams. bad about it after the fact. Um, all right, let's go to some uh, IMs and then we're going to get out of here, folks. Kralzor, what do you think of the Democrats, leftists, uh, et cetera, advocating for amending the Apportionment Act to increase the size of the House to address the disparity between representatives to make them possibly more responsive to constituents? Uh, totally for it. Yeah. More democracy. Overdue. Well overdue. Josh from Chicago. Sam, is the mise-en-scene with Jamie's camera up to standard? Well, I, I have a wide uh, berth in this era. Uh, Sam, just call her Nomi. Problem solved. Well, if her show was called the Nomi Show, it would be great. But it's uh, Noma Key. Yay. Good job. Did you see how I did, like, like, like I had to step up to the side of that before I uh, launched it? Uh Ty from Tennessee. Hey, Sam, you may have missed it, but uh, you and Noma Key had a cameo on the Joe Rogan experience. Yep. Uh, Thames Darwin. Sam, I want to extend kudos uh, to your young letter writer, in particular for memorizing the MR intro, a feat never accomplished by Michael or old Matt. One of my earliest MR memories is an M&M Monday in which Matt was doing the intro. And Michael was correcting him off camera, <laughs> which in his case was like the blind leading the blind. Good time. <laughs> yes. I don't think Michael ever got that down. Uh, DMV Mike, Sam, I assume you had a golf phase as a youth. Any fun stories? I did not. Sadly, no, I, the, I, 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 I didn't have any phases. I I have really been this bland. Um, (laughs) Uh, honestly, like I, I, I saw some pictures. I was going back to, I found some video from 1991 and it, 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 it looks like I'm wearing the exact same shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, big, uh, government socialist. Um, I love you guys. Jamie's giggle is the best sound drop P word. Sam, have you ever played disc golf? Yes. In fact, I did back in the day. Yes. I've been playing more this summer and I feel you would enjoy it. It has a nice mix of walking, nerdiness, and technique. It's also very cheap to play. Yes, I, I, I did. As I, at, at, well, one can at one, one point I did, I was a disc golf. In fact, I, I got sort of obsessed with this, um, this team of disc golfers. Or maybe they were, well, I don't, some, some golf, uh, some uh, a Frisbee they called the rude boys. And they were on a plane and they gave me a bunch of their paraphernalia and, then I got into ska a little bit for like a week. Uh, is a uh, run PMC is the Pelosi and cuties defender going to be on again tomorrow? I believe if you're talking about uh, Mad Bender, yeah. <laughs> uh, Chevalier writes, uh, Chile violates human rights. Can I get a, 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 a shofar for becoming a U.S. citizen two weeks ago as a former DACA recipient? Trump cannot win. Congratulations to you. Very apropos because we're very close to Rosh Hashanah. Friday, I think, right? Winnipeg Craig. Hey, Sam, hoping I could get the birthday show far. 31 today. You got it. Why not? I'm getting a little loose with these babies. And as a second birthday president, would love to hear your take on the Greens in Wisconsin. Their party president said they found those Republican lawyers by Googling lawyer. I don't think most people understand what that says about how illegitimate and disorganized they actually are. First off, I'm not sure I believe that. Uh, but if that's the case, that's absurd. Um, and it's really fortuitous that they found that Republican. But 
Beyond that, they were completely incompetent. They completely could have filed an affidavit at the time. They could have corrected it. They refused to do it, or they were just too incompetent to do it. I'm sorry. If you're not competent enough to fix that without going to court with the help of a pro bono Republican lawyer, then what is it that you think you're going to achieve by running? I mean, obviously, like, like, uh, like, uh, honestly, this is just, it's just, it's just pathetic. It's pathetic. Yeah. Skeptical of Sam's internet, BBC and Yahoo now reporting the hysterectomy story and Congressman Raja uh, Cornsmooth tweeted about it uh, as well. Now, Jollywood, uh, one, two, three, now say no McKee. No McKee. Okay. The excess death rates are better here because our baseline infant mortality rates, cardiovascular outcomes, and cancer outcomes are comparatively worse, and we have something no one else has, uninsured people. Kowalski, hey, Sam and Matt and Admiral Jamie, TMBS was good last night. I only wish someone would pick up the mantle of fat shaming of the president that Michael did. <laughs> oh I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not, as, I'm not as on that beat. Jamie, you should look into the video game Tonight We Riot. You play revolutionaries fighting the police and capitalists. Sam, you look like you need some sleep, probably. <laughs> Personal note, I'm planning on launching a YouTube channel after harvest season. I'll keep you posted. I think uh, about, I think after the show yesterday, I might call it Prairie Fire. I think talking about progressive movement history in the Great Plains might uh, help deprogram a lot of people out here who may not have realized what their forebearers stood for and fought for. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's Kowalski? Yeah. I would do I'll it guest. Your, I would do it in your barn, man. I would do it in your barn. Mm -hmm. Let me know. I'll, I'll appear on that. Yeah. All right. Big, big socialist history out Four there. Four more of these. South Dakota progressive. Call me crazy, but I think I've missed most since the pandemic started is Matt's sound drops. <laughs> help with the connectivity. It's working. It's very exciting. In the Dave Rubin recovery mode drop are a few favorites. Any chance we get the drops back with the new systems, Cal, working on? We, we should be able to do that, right, Matt? Yeah, we can maybe try some of that. I think we're ready for something like that. Uh, the Big Ten announced they're going to start having football games in October. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we'll see. Good luck. Sam's colon. Um or Mardinity? Um, it's just a potato. Um, potato situation. Got to jump. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Jay Shivone, first time hearing 12 angry men used as a verb. Well done, Matt. Maybe pass that along to Ben Mankiewicz. And the final, I am of this very day. Nearly all of my family here are mega MAGA. And I often say, you guys gave me my morality. You guys taught me how to be a good person. You guys taught me to treat everyone with grace and love. And I feel betrayed because you aren't living those lessons and look past concentration camps on the border. I think it gets their attention for eight seconds before they go, uh, to mega MAGA lib tears mode. I've shunned them and frankly feel alone. Well, Ryan, uh, why Oming? Uh, yeah, at the very least you have us. What it's worth. Sorry. Yeah. Hang in there, man. Hang in there. Um, this, I, I, I can almost guarantee you that at least one member of your family will return to some measure of normalcy within the next five years. So, Boom. Go into the sort of like silent bearing witness mode, maybe. Don't go to the frontal attack mode. Yep. Hang in there. All right, folks. Jamie, Matt, good show, guys. See you all tomorrow, sort of. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow. I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught But see the truth of the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better